And I see that we now have a quorum, and I now recognize myself for opening remarks. Let me start by thanking Secretary Blinken for appearing before the committee today to represent the administration's fiscal year 2023 budget request and priorities for U.S. foreign policy. This budget request makes clear the administration is putting diplomacy and development first, leveraging the United States' unparalleled soft power, network of alliances, and unmatched influence at international organizations and institutions to protect the American people and advance the United States' national interests. And Mr. Secretary, since your last appearance before this committee, We've seen, unfortunately, Russia launch an unjustifiable and renewed full-scale war of choice against Ukraine. And I want to take, thank the, take the opportunity to commend you and President Biden and the administration for leading the global effort to support Ukraine as it repels this act of Russian aggression. The Biden-Harris administration through his handling of the Ukraine crisis, has demonstrated what can be achieved when the United States leadership is marshaled to push back against brazen aggression and attacks on sovereignty, democracy, and human rights. And while Russia and Ukraine are understandably on the top of everyone's mind, we also cannot take our eyes off other threats and challenges that we must face in partnership with other allies and global community, whether they be the expansionists of China, preventing a nuclear-armed Iran, drought and political instability in the Horn of Africa, the ongoing effects of COVID-19, or the existential threat of climate change and armed conflict around the world. Indeed, Russia's war on Ukraine has only intensified some of these challenges. In Africa, the home of the largest concentrations of internally displaced and refugee <coughs> populations on the planet, these vulnerable populations are bearing the brunt of rising food insecurity, which has been exacerbated by Putin's war in Ukraine and threatens hunger around the world. We should celebrate where we're seeing successes. For example, in Yemen, a fragile truce brokered with the assistance of the UN and the United States Special Envoy, which offers a vital opportunity for warring par parties to commit to a lasting ceasefire. But many daunting challenges remain. Following our withdrawal from Afghanistan, the end of that war raises important questions about how we move forward after a 20-year conflict and how to best help the Afghan people especially the women and girls of the country, and address a humanitarian crisis. And it is vital that the United States also remain focused on our regional neighbors in Central and South America and the Caribbean. And over the past several years, we have seen a deterioration of democracy globally, including in several Western countries in the Western Hemisphere, which have also been marked by weakened democratic institutions, politicized judicial systems, corruption scandals, and blatant lack of respect for the rule of law. Despite these challenges, there are some reasons also, though, to celebrate and be hopeful. I never like to be just negative and to also point out some of the hopeful things. Barbados became a republic and swore in its first president since it became independent 55 years ago. And we're also seeing positive changes with recently inaugurated presidents in both Honduras and Chile, ushering in, a new, ushering in new perspectives on fighting corruption and strengthening democracy. And for the first time since 1994, the United States is hosting the Summit of the Americas, this time in Los Angeles, with a focus on a sustainable, resilient, an equitable future and recommitment to upholding democracy in the region. And of course, we cannot meet global challenges without providing our diplomatic and development professionals the tools that they need to succeed. So I welcome the administration's recent steps to build a more agile, diverse, and equitable workforce. I'd be remiss if I didn't implore the department to do more, particularly to address inequities 
at the mid and senior ranks and address notable disparities in career progressions. The department's establishment of paid internship positions is an in important development, key to opening the door for historically excluded groups. And I hope the department will take further steps to convert its internships entirely to a paid status. I also appreciate the steps the department has taken to support more expeditionary diplomacy and face-to-face -face engagement in support of America's interests around the world, as well as to modernize visa and passport processes that further facilitate such engagement. In addition, I am encouraged to see the department prioritize meeting its obligations at the UN, where the United States remains the largest contributor to global peacekeeping operations and other important multilateral efforts. So, Secretary Blinken, <clears throat> let me again thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being uh, the face to American diplomacy uh, and working around the world. Uh, there's so many things that's happening uh, at this time in our history, but I do believe that in the end, the camera of history will record us as taking us into a better place once we get out of this tough place that we're in right now, primarily led by uh, Putin's uh, vicious and unilateral war against democracy that I think really not just in Ukraine, but around the world. And I look forward to hearing your testimony and answers to what I know will be very thoughtful uh, questions from our members, and I now yield to uh, Mr. McCall for his opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here today. Uh, I also want to thank you for meeting with us when we were in Poland uh, recently. We had a, a very good discussion. Um, in fact, I've been there twice in the last uh, month. Um, but I will say our delegation, bipartisan, came back um, resolved uh, more than ever that we need to help Ukraine win this war. And uh, it was very bipartisan. Um, and I also want to thank you, sir, and the State Department for your efforts to bring Trevor Reed home to his family. I've met with his parents many times. Um, I want to thank the Special Presidential Envoy for Hostage Affairs, Roger Karstens, and U.S. Ambassador John Sullivan, good friend of mine, who are really critical um, to bring him home, securing his freedom. Um, his parents are very grateful, sir, and we thank you and your team for that. We're currently wit witnessing the largest invasion in Europe since World War II, my father's war. And uh, as you know, the brutality is uh, shocking. Uh, we just passed a war crimes bill, the chairman and I on the floor, bipartisan, uh, calling these out for what they are and holding Mr. Putin accountable as a war criminal. But the images of corpse, corpses littering the streets uh, after Bucha, hands tied behind their backs, bullets in their heads, uh, reports of mobile crematoriums being brought in to cover up the mounting body count and cover up the evidence, a pregnant woman covered in blood being carried out of a recently bombed maternity hospital, for God's sakes. Tragically, both she and her baby, as you know, did not survive. But these are Putin's war crimes, and he must be held accountable. He fancies himself as reclaiming the glory of the Russian Empire, yet his legacy will be that of a war criminal. And yet, in the face of these horrors, President Zelensky, I think, and the people of Ukraine have really inspired the world with their bravery and their determination. And I appreciate the fact, sir, that you went to Kyiv with the Secretary of Defense uh, to meet with him. I think that was very, very important. And I'd like, love to hear more about that visit. Um, but you know, they're standing in front of these tanks, risking their lives to fight for their freedom. And against all odds, they're holding off the invading horde. We were told four days this would be over. We're now into the third month. Mr. Putin has underestimated the Ukrainian people, I think to his own peril. And that's why it's critical, as you know, to get Ukraine the weapons they need to completely defeat 
Putin's invasion now. I appreciate the efforts made to, to get these desperately needed weapons into the hands of Ukrainians once the war started. Uh, I wish more of these weapons had gone in before the invasion and not after. I know there was concern about prov provocation, provoking Putin. Um, the president, in my view, sat on cr critical weapons packages in the spring of 2021 and again in November of 2021, all the while Russia amassed its massive troops on the border. And as the battle for the Donbass heats up, the United States and our allies are only just now training Ukrainians on vital heavy weapons, uh, including MLRS artillery, air defenses, armed drones, and tanks. As President Zelensky put it, he said, you know, it's unfair that Ukraine is still forced to ask for what its partners have been storing somewhere for years. If they have the weapons that Ukraine needs here, we need them now. If they have the ammunition that we need here and now, it is their moral duty, first of all, to help protect freedom. And they said, help save the lives. This would help save the lives of thousands of Ukrainians. As I've often said, the world is watching. This is an historic time. And history will judge us by how we respond and whether we learn from our mistakes. I will say the narrative has gone from it will be over in four days to we need to help Ukraine defend themselves to I was very pleased to hear you and Secretary Austin say Ukraine can win. And I think the narrative has changed with the American people as well as they see the horrific images coming out of these atrocities. And I know with Mariupol, when, once the dust settles, we're gonna hear, uh, we, I think we just scratched the surface, unfortunately. This unprovoked on, on Ukraine has opened the world's eyes to the threat, though, of other malign actors, primarily China, and to our partner, Taiwan. Uh, at the Winter Olympics, as you know, Putin and the Chinese Communist Party General, Secretary Xi, announced their uh, unholy alliance, no limits, they call it, compact against the United States and NATO. I think it was not a question of if, but when. And I think Putin made the calculation uh, based on what he saw that this was the time. And we're very worried that President Xi may make the same calculation. I hope with Putin's miscalculation, however, and his uh, lack of success, if you will, he will change that, uh, that paradigm. But they just reached a secret military agreement between the Solomon Islands, China did, which took us all by surprise. These are the very islands that my father's generation fought and died for to liberate during World War II. And now it's under the thumb of the CCP. It's clear that they're preparing for some sort of conflict, whether it's by military or otherwise. And I think the United States must act now to prevent such an invasion. We must also make sure our defense industrial base is embracing innovation to make weapons more quickly using 21st century technology. In short, our arsenal of democracy needs rejuvenation. And that may be for a longer discussion so that we could have. Uh, but the, the slow pace of these weapons that the chairman and I sign off on not going out raises concerns. Turning to Afghanistan, Republicans and Democrats alike express alarm over the administration's failure to prepare for the fallout of the withdrawal. We were promised that this would be planned for all contingencies, but in the end, 13 soldiers died during the evacuation. Hundreds of American citizens and tens of thousands of Afghan partners were left behind. I will be releasing an interim report very soon outlining what our investigation has discovered so far. And I look forward to discussing that report with you, uh, sir. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, we're in this together. 
and it is the interest of the free world to defeat the evils of Mr. Putin and all of our foreign nation adversary countries. Uh, and with that, I yield back. It's now my honor to introduce the Honorable Anthony J. Blinken, who currently serves as the nation's 71st Secretary of State. So there's a lot of questions I don't want to be asked, so in the interest of time, I'll skip your biography, Mr. Secretary. I think everyone knows it as well you know, on this committee, uh, and we've uh, introduced you in the past. So basically, we're gonna, you'll have five minutes to deliver your opening of remarks, and uh, I will be uh, generally tap my gavel uh, at the appropriate time. I may be a little more liberal with you to uh, get to, because I think it's significant and important to, you're, hear, you're liberal. To, to, <laughs> to hear from you and, uh, and, and the reports back as we deal with the government's uh, budgetary concerns with the uh, request uh, with reference to the state uh, authorization uh, and, and the State Department. You're now recognized for five minutes. Uh, Chairman Meeks, uh, Ranking Member McCall, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here today to speak about the administration's proposed budget at the State Department, uh, but thank you more broadly. Secretary, could you pull the mic a little closer, yes. maybe? Sorry. Is that better? Try that. Um, but thank you as well for your partnership and also for your leadership. Uh, that uh, CODEL that both of you led in Poland at a critical moment um, made a big difference. And it's been gratifying to be able to work with both of you and other members on this urgent uh, issue, but also on, on many others, and I deeply uh, appreciate it. Um, and I did recently get back from Kyiv with uh, Secretary Austin, where uh, we wanted to show, as well as deliver on, uh, America's commitment to the government and to the people of Ukraine. This brutal war of aggression against Ukraine has underscored to me the power and the purpose of American diplomacy. Uh, our diplomacy is rallying allies and partners around the world to join us in supporting Ukraine with security, economic, humanitarian assistance, to impose massive costs on Russia for its aggression, to strengthen our collective security and defense, and to address the war's mounting global consequences, including the refugee and food crises that have flown from it. Uh, we have to continue to drive this diplomacy forward, also to seize the strategic opportunities and address some of the risks that are presented by Russia's overreach as countries reconsider their policies, their priorities, their relationships. Uh, the budget request before you uh, predates the crisis, but fully funding it and the new emergency resources that the President requested earlier today is critical to ensuring that Russia's war in Ukraine is a strategic failure for the Kremlin and serves as a powerful lesson to those who might consider following its path. Uh, the supplemental resources Congress provided in March have made a decisive difference on the battlefield helping Ukrainians defend their country and win the battle for Kyiv. Your support also helped meet the mounting costs caused by the, the Kremlin's brutal invasion uh, in Ukraine itself, across Europe, around the world, while bolstering the security of our allies and partners. That this assistance was provided with broad bipartisan support has sent a clear signal uh, of the United States' commitment to the Ukrainian government and to its people. Uh, we ask that Congress do the same with the emergency request that's before you as of today which seeks $20.5 billion for security assistance, $8.5 billion for economic assistance, and $3 billion for humanitarian aid, including to address the growing global food security crisis, which is a direct result of Russia's aggression. Approximately $14 billion of this request would be directed to the State Department and to USAID. Uh, let me just underscore, uh, we can't take our progress so far for granted. Ukraine's enduring independence and sovereignty depends in no small part on ensuring that the country's brave defenders have what they need to keep up the fight and meet the urgent needs of their people. But, Mr. Chairman, to your point, <clears throat> as we focus on this urgent crisis, the State Department continues to carry out missions that are front and center to our diplomacy, like responsibly managing great power competition with China, facilitating a halt to fighting in Yemen and Ethiopia, pushing back against the rising tide of authoritarianism uh, and the threat that it poses to democracy and human rights. We also have evolving challenges that require us to develop new capabilities, like the emergence and reemergence of infectious disease, an accelerating climate crisis, a digital revolution 
that holds enormous promise but also real peril. Uh, last fall, I had a chance to set out a modernization agenda for the Department and for U.S. diplomacy to enable us to even more effectively respond to many of these complex demands. And in no small part, thanks to the FY22 budget approved by Congress, we have been able to make real progress uh, on this agenda, though much remains to be done. Uh, to give just a few quick examples, we have strengthened our capacity to shape the ongoing technological revolution so that it actually protects our interests, it boosts American competitiveness, it upholds our values. With bipartisan congressional support and encouragement, we just launched a new bureau for cyberspace and digital policy with 60 team members uh, to start, and I am grateful for the support and the advice that we got along the way. We are also making headway on ensuring that our diplomats reflect America's remarkable diversity. This is a tremendous source of strength for our diplomacy. The Department's first ever Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer has spearheaded an effort to analyze and address the obstacles that have been preventing underrepresented groups from joining but also advancing at the State Department. We have expanded the Pickering and Wrangell Fellowship programs and, Mr. Chairman, as you said, paid internships at State again with strong congressional input and support. My first uh, 15 months on this job have only strengthened my conviction that these and other reforms aren't just worthwhile, they are essential to delivering for the American people. Ensuring we can deliver on this agenda will require sustained funding, uh, some new authorities, and most importantly, partnership from Congress. That's why I'm grateful to have worked with Congress to reestablish a formal dialogue on the State Department authorization. Uh, last month, we sent um, uh, congressional staff the first package of legislative authorities required to meet the challenges we face, and we expect to send more in the coming weeks and to working with you uh, on state authorization. If we want to deepen our capability in key areas like climate and multilateral diplomacy, if we want to expand on Secretary Powell's vision of a Foreign Service training float, if we want to strengthen global health security and the capacity to prevent, uh, to, prevent to detect and respond to future outbreaks, we will need some additional resources. If we want to be able to swiftly stand up new missions to deploy our diplomats when and where they are needed and make these decisions based on risk management, not risk aversion, we will need to reform the Security Embassy Construction and Counterterrorism Act. Um, there are other things that I would point to that we need to do, uh, but we look forward to working with you uh, on that. So in the interest of time, let me stop there, and of course we can address these and many other issues uh, throughout the course of the testimony. Thank you. Very good to be with everyone. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Secretary. And I'm now going to begin to recognize members for five minutes each, pursuant to the House rules. All time yielded is for the purposes of questioning our witnesses. Uh, I'll recognize uh, members uh, by alternating between Democrats and Republicans. Uh, and if you miss your turn, uh, please let our staff know and we'll come back to you. Uh, if you seek recognition, you must unmute your microphone and address the chair verbally and identify yourself so that uh, we know who is speaking. Uh, one of the other things that may come up are votes. Uh, and we're going to try to continue the hearings uh, so members be aware. We're going to try to then send some members to go vote and come back so that we will be able to uh, make sure we're maximizing the time that we have the secretary. He has a hard stop at 4.30, uh, and so we're going to try to get uh, uh, as many questions in as we came. Many of you are aware that when I became chair of the committee that I made a commitment to elevate the voice and the role of not only our senior members and our subcommittee chairs, but also of rank and file members, including and especially our junior members who bring valuable experience and perspectives <laughs> to this committee. And as such, you know, for budget hearings with the secretary, you know, I have committed that uh, whenever we hold such hearings, that all members who were not able to ask questions previously due to time constraints, that I would resume the next hearing where the previous one had ended. And as such, uh, I, I believe that uh, Ranking Member McCall will also give members who did not have an opportunity on the Republican side, uh, th those that did not have an uh, opportunity to ask questions the last time, uh, to ask questions uh, first also. Uh, and uh, that would be, of course, uh, after Mr. McCall and I ask our questions. <laughs> That's fitting. <laughs> um, so 
Let me start by recognizing myself uh, for five minutes for the purposes of asking questions and just so that the members would know, the first ones on uh, the member side to ask questions on the Democratic side will be uh, Mr. Malinowski uh, and on the Republican side, Mr. Jackson. Mr. Secretary, there's so many things that we could ask. I'm gonna to try to focus my questions just on the, since this is a budget hearing, uh, on trying to focus on uh, what's happening internally within the state. Uh, and you know what's been really important to me uh, looking at it, and last year, uh, fortunately, this committee passed the very first state authorization bill to be signed into law since 2002 which included many important measures to promote diversity and inclusion at state, including the establishment of an appeals process for security clearance restrictions and mandatory training for hiring managers on implicit bias. So the budget, how will the budget request enable state to carry out uh, those new authorities uh, and integrate them with other uh, DEI activities? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And, um, let me underscore something that you said, but also that you've been leading on, which is, uh, as I said, our determination to make sure that we are building a department that actually reflects the people that it represents. And we have taken steps over the last uh, 15 months that I think put us in dramatically in a new place and better place to actually make good on that <coughs> commitment. The uh, appointment, the creation and appointment of a chief diversity and inclusion officer and office that goes with it reporting directly to me on the seventh floor of the State Department. Senior officials in every bureau responsible for tracking and making sure that we're following through on this agenda. A five-year strategic plan that was just put forward uh, on diversity, inclusion, access. Um, a plan that reflects input from more than 700 foreign service officers and civil servants, as well as, of course, uh, many experts. Um, work that we're doing, innovative work, to actually get data disaggregated so we have a complete uh, picture of where we are and where we're not. Um, programs, for example, as well, uh, to make good on uh, one of the challenges we have, not only getting people through the doors of C Street to join the department, but to keep them there once they're there. And we've had issues with that. Um, we've seen disproportionately um, foreign service officers, civil servants from underrepresented groups of the department leave. We want to understand why, and we want to make the changes necessary. So we have an entire program now uh, for retention, including exit interviews, so we actually understand what's motivating people to leave, and if there's a concern that we can address, we address it. Uh, the paid internships that you referenced, these are critical uh, to making sure that socioeconomically, we have people who start out and open their, uh, their eyes and minds to the perspective of having a career in foreign policy, the State Department, that they're at the department, they have the ability to do that. That's critical. And for all of these programs and more, the budget lays out uh, a funding request to make sure that we can actually carry them through. Uh, and so we really welcome the partnership with, with Congress on this. My, my commitment is this. Um, this is turning around to some extent a, a, uh, an aircraft carrier. It's not gonna, it doesn't happen overnight. But by what we're doing, by what we're putting in place, I'm convinced that over the next few years, if we sustain it and stick to it, and resource it, you're going to see manifest progress uh, throughout the ranks, making sure people have career paths that they can aspire to and get to the highest positions in the department. All of that will play out over a few years, but we've now put in place the building blocks to do that more effectively, <coughs> and I hope that the resources can follow. Thank you for that. And, and also, I think that uh, I have to raise uh, this question also, Mr. Secretary. You know, during the early uh, chaotic days of Russia's horrific invasion of Ukraine, uh, there were some reports and videos of the mistreatment of non-white residents of Ukraine while trying to flee the country. Uh, and during my trip that uh, Mr. McCall and I uh, took uh, to the, Pol the Polish-Ukrainian border, I was assured that any mistreatment or discrimination uh, was being addressed. And so I just have to ask the question, Mr. Secretary, are you aware of any further such discrimination against non-white refugees, and did this come up, you know, at your recent travel in Poland? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we took these reports very seriously, and not only did we take them seriously, uh, we acted on them. So when this first emerged, uh, we were immediately in contact with uh, our counterparts in Ukraine, uh, as well as uh, in neighboring countries uh, like Poland. 
making sure that um, they saw what uh, was apparently happening and that they took action to, to correct it. Uh, and as I've seen it, and we're happy to provide more information to, uh, to the committee, uh, the, the governments in question uh, did take action to send very clear uh, messages to uh, folks throughout their system uh, that uh, people could not uh, in any way be mistreated or treated differently, in particular as they were trying to leave uh, uh, Ukraine in the face of the Russian onslaught. Um, to the best of my knowledge, um, the reports of such incidents have uh, decreased uh, uh, significantly, but it's something that we, we track and uh, we'll be happy to be in close touch with you. Needless to say, if any further reports emerge, please let us know so that we can follow up with the governments in question. <clears throat> and, and before I go to Mr. McCall, I just got one final question I need to ask Mr. Secretary, uh, recognizing the disparities by the, uh, uh, the province in, Af in, Af in Afghanistan uh, before the fall of the Ghani government. Um, how would you characterize the, situa the security situation in Afghanistan and the treatment especially of, of women and girls in Afghanistan under the Taliban rule as, as we speak right now? Thank you. Um, very quickly, I'd say this. The overall level of violence in the country has decreased, but we are seeing terrorist attacks, uh, including uh, horrifically, uh, most recently, uh, against uh, uh, Hazar and Shiite minorities. Um, we are, of course, seeing retribution uh, attacks by um, uh, Taliban uh, against those who were uh, part of the former uh, government. These seem to be, uh, for the most part, not centrally directed. Uh, that is, they, they, they tend to be happening at a local level, but they're happening. And that, of course, uh, is egregious. Um, and then more generally, there's no doubt that when it comes to the basic rights of the Afghan people, uh, and especially women and girls, uh, that has moved backwards uh, across the board. Um, we've seen, for example, when it comes to women and girls, the uh, inability of girls to go to school above the, the sixth grade. The Taliban had made a commitment that they would be allowed to do so. It reneged on that commitment. <coughs> um, we are pressing, and many other countries are pressing very hard on the Taliban uh, to make good on what it said it would do. We'll see uh, if they do that. Um, so the uh, rights picture is, uh, is challenging. The security picture, as I said, is mixed because while the overall level of violence has gone down, terrorism attacks within Afghanistan against Afghans uh, continue, and some of these retribution <coughs> attacks continue. Mr. McCall. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Secretary, um, you know, I, I've been critical that more weapons didn't go in before the invasion. Uh, it seemed to be waiting till after the invasion. Uh, I will say I was in uh, at the Polish-Ukraine border uh, last week, and I, I was actually very pleased to see um, a lot of 18-wheelers going in, and we know what they were carrying. Um, but Zelensky said if we had access to all the weapons we need, which our partners have and which are comparable to the weapons used by the Russian Federation, we would have already ended this war. I don't think we can afford to make the same mistakes, though, uh, in Taiwan. The stakes are high. They make 90% of uh, advanced semiconductor chips. Um, if the CCP controlled, uh, they take Taiwan, they could weaponize the semiconductor supply chain and decimate the United States economy. Um, a CCP-controlled Taiwan would give China a physical base in the first island chain that would cut the U.S. off from our allies and put us at a strategic disadvantage uh, to future aggression and I already talked about the Solomon Islands and that security agreement. My question, very quickly, the chairman and I do sign off on foreign military weapons sales. Um, we sent a letter, a joint letter, to you on December the 3rd of last year um, there are about 10 weapon systems. I won't go into detail on all of them, but all very important. When I met the ambassador uh, from Taiwan, she said, I, I have not received any of these. I think deterrence is important here. Um, and we wrote to request notification of the pending shipment of, of these sales to Taiwan. Um, why, why is this being held up? These are... 
many of these were signed off by the chairman and myself two years ago. Um, thank you. Let me just very quickly address Ukraine and then come quickly to your, to your question. Uh, first on Ukraine, again, with great appreciation for everything that uh, you've done, uh, that the, the chairman has done and continue to do, um, and we've, not, we've got to keep doing together. Um, the reason that the Ukrainians uh, were able so effectively to push back the Russians from their aggression uh, against Kyiv and the surrounding areas and push them back to the east and the south is two things. One, starting with their remarkable courage and resilience, which the Russians underestimated and probably the entire world did. But two, because they actually had in hand, in the moment, the tools they needed to do it. And the reason that they had these, those tools in hand is because, among other things, President Biden engaged in a drawdown way back in Labor Day of last year, uh, another one, Christmas time. Uh, these things were not. And, and I, Paul, I get two minutes and I have one more question yeah. for you. So I just wanted to make, make that. When, is, when, when, when will Taiwan receive these weapons? So on, on Taiwan, uh, two things. Um, I agree with you that it is uh, vital that uh, Taiwan continue to have the means to defend itself because we've seen uh, mounting aggression from. And I agree. I, I think there's a pro I don't know if it's state or DOD or defense contractors, but maybe to move so, on to my next to, it to maybe it'd be left, helpful the, if we got state and DOD and the contractors in the same room together to find out how can we fix this broken system. And you, as you know, these are our Patriot battery systems, right? We can't even give those to the eastern flank NATO countries. Uh, we got a serious backlog in weapon systems, and I'd like to work with you uh, to fix that. My last question, Financial Times broke a story uh, yesterday that the CCP's national champion for memory chips, a company called YMTC, is breaking the U.S. foreign direct product rule and providing critical technology to Huawei. Do you agree that any company that violates U.S. law uh, to provide critical technology to a sanctioned CCP-controlled country poses a threat to our national security? And if so, would you commit today to getting YMTC, which is a real threat, sir, as you know, putting that on the entities list? Um, first, just uh, quickly on, on Taiwan, I welcome working with you. Uh, and other members on this to make sure that we can streamline the timelines yep. uh, to make sure that they are getting what they need to defend themselves. Second, with regard to the specific case, I uh, will commit right now to look into it uh, as soon as we're done uh, to figure out what's going on and if there is sanctionable activity to make sure that it's sanctioned. Well, we're providing the equipment to, that they buy from the United States to make these advanced uh, semiconductor chips. Um, and I think it, it, you know, we need to work on this uh, entities list. I think Department of Commerce and DOD, we've got to harmonize this. And we also need to look at outbound investment screening uh, with all the technology and capital flows going into China, which you know they use and were the backbone that were made in America, but then they also made uh, their hypersonic weapon. And I sent a letter to Secretary Romano about this, you know, as well. And I would hope you especially take a look at this particular uh, company. And thank you, sir. Chairman's time has expired. I now recognize Representative Tom Melanowski from New Jersey, who's the Vice Chair of the full committee for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you for going to Kiev. Thank you for um, everything that you have done and that President Biden has done to stand with Ukraine and for showing the world once again what principled American leadership in the world can do. It's been absolutely extraordinary. Uh, I have some questions that mostly will focus on sanctions, um, the economic side of, of this war. Yesterday, as you know, the House passed uh, legislation that I led with Representative Joe Wilson um, that was designed to encourage the use of uh, frozen, uh, blocked Russian assets ultimately in the rebuilding of Ukraine. And I was delighted to see today the, the President, the administration, embrace this basic principle that that we should be using the wealth that built the Putin regime to rebuild the country that Putin is destroying. Um, most of my questions about that have been answered just in the last 24 hours. Uh, I did want to ask one question that I think as we work together on this uh, will, will probably be pretty crucial, and that is, you know, we're talking about the oligarchs and the yachts and the, the villas and bank accounts and so forth. 
But if we, if we accept that principle, um, do you think it might also apply to state assets? For example, the, the much larger uh, amount of money that has been frozen around the world belonging to the Russian Central Bank? Um, in short, yes. And this is one of the things that we've asked our own lawyers to look at, which is uh, what authorities would be needed potentially uh, to, uh, to seize those assets, but not only to seize them, uh, but to use them in exactly the ways that you and um, uh, Congressman Wilson have suggested uh, in, your, in your legislation. Okay. Thank you. Um, more broadly, it seems to me that this is a moment kind of like 9-11, a moment when um, people and countries around the world need to choose what side they're on. Um, we've imposed extraordinary sanctions with our allies, but I, I am concerned um, that those sanctions may be undermined by other countries that may, may view uh, participation uh, as optional, may be hedging their bets. We have countries around the world continuing to purchase not just Russian oil, but diamonds, for, for example. We, uh, we have Roman Abramovich's yacht um, uh, sailing into uh, a harbor in Turkey. Um, I'm particularly concerned about countries in the Persian Gulf. I'm sure you've seen the reports uh, of dozens of Russian officials, business people close to Putin owning property in the United Arab Emirates, and in the last few weeks, uh, significant potential targets of sanctions, moving assets into the UAE in particular. Clearly, they're doing this because they believe that if they are sanctioned, they will be safe in these countries. So I guess what I want to ask you is, are they right? Will they be safe? We are looking around the world at um, where resources are moving as well as where countries or institutions may be trying to help uh, evade the sanctions or in any way undermine them. Uh, thanks to um, the uh, colleagues in the Senate, we now have uh, working for us a uh, sanctions coordinator who rep who's reports directly to me, Jim O'Brien. This is one of his areas of focus, to look at sanctions evasion and to uh, make sure that we are doing everything we can to cut off any such evasion. Um, we're working that as well with our G7 partners. Um, and I'd just say very quickly two things. Look, it's much better in the first instance if we can get any countries in question to voluntarily make sure that they're joining us in uh, implementing the sanctions and not allowing them to be evaded. But if, uh, if necessary to use authorities that we have uh, to take action against those that are, that are not, that's some, certainly something we're looking at. Right. Last thing is this. I mentioned this in my opening remarks. A number of countries around the, uh, around the world are rethinking their relationships, including their relationship with Russia, uh, going forward. And some of them have had relationships with Russia going back decades, including at times when we couldn't have the same kind of relationship with them, and, and now we can. We also need to make sure that we are um, uh, helping advance that transition and doing it in a way that, as a strategic matter, um, moves things in the right direction. Uh, and that's something we're factoring in as well. Well, thank you. I, I, I hope we, we recognize who has the power in our relationship with some of these countries, and particularly the Gulf countries. Ask the question, are they America's allies in the Gulf or Russia's allies in the Gulf? Gentlemen's time has expired. I now recognize Representative Ronnie Jackson of Texas for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Member McCall. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here today. Mr. Secretary, it's hard to see any signs of success from the Biden administration over the past 15 months. Our constituents are facing higher prices and lower supplies across all industries, particularly at the gas pump. The world is markedly less safe, and many of our allies are in immediate danger. And the administration seems more worried about catering to the socialist left than about virtue signaling, signaling than about actually getting things done to help everyday Americans. Since this administration took office, our three main global adversaries have, been, have become emboldened and strengthened. In Europe, President Biden failed to deter Vladimir Putin from invading Ukraine despite ample evidence for months of military buildup, and now we all watch with horror at war crimes and the violence that's unfolding. In the Indo-Pacific, as I saw firsthand on a CODEL I recently was on last week to Australia, Japan, and Taiwan, China continues its attempts to disrupt the world order through threatening its neighbors like Taiwan, through vaccine diplomacy for a virus it both created and covered up, and through its malicious Belt and Road Initiative. 
And in the Middle East, according to reports from negotiations in Vienna, Iran stands poised to receive enormous gains without giving up its nuclear deployment. Each concession by this administration means more of our service members abroad and more of our allies, particularly Israel, are at imminent risk. Mr. Secretary, I think many of us in this room are concerned about the evolving crisis faced by Taiwan, and that's been mentioned, and the economic and security risk of nations around the world if China decides to invade Taiwan. We have witnessed two enormous foreign policy failures, in my opinion, between this administration's withdrawal from Afghanistan and its early concessions to Russia as Putin prepared for and then invaded Ukraine. It is clear from these actions and from what I've learned during my meetings on this recent CODEL that we must reestablish confidence in our allies. Mr. Secretary, what steps are you taking to ensure allies like Taiwan are confident in America's support, particularly after our mistakes in Afghanistan and Ukraine? Thank you. Uh, look, I don't want to put words in, in allies and partners' mouths. That wouldn't be appropriate, but I think it's fair to say from what I'm hearing around the world, and I would certainly invite the chairman and the ranking member uh, as well who have been um, uh, making the rounds, uh, I would suggest to you that the confidence of our allies and partners in the United States right now is at a high point, precisely because of the leadership that we have exerted through these many months with regard to Ukraine, but also on many other issues. Indeed, Congressman, one of the first instructions I had uh, on taking office from President Biden was to focus on re-energizing and re revitalizing these, al these alliances and partnerships, and that's exactly what we did. We are now in better standing at NATO uh, than we've been and as long as I can remember. Uh, we have revitalized partnerships throughout the Asia Pacific, where, where you are, including with Japan, with Korea, uh, with Australia, with New Zealand. Uh, we have energized the, the quad that brings together the United States, India, Australia, uh, and Japan. Uh, as you know, this is a vital institution. Uh, we have reengaged with ASEAN across the board, and I could go down the list. Uh, I think our standing with allies and partners is stronger than it's ever been, and there's a good reason for it, and you're right to focus on it. It's because most of the challenges we face are most effectively dealt with when we're working together with allies and partners. And that's exactly what you're seeing in Ukraine right now. Because of all the countries that we have brought together, the Ukrainians have what they need to repel this Russian aggression. We've got to keep working on that. Secretary of Defense was just in Germany with 40 other defense ministers from around the world to make sure that we can continue to get the Ukrainians exactly what they need to continue to do the job. And on Taiwan, we are resolute in uh, making sure that Taiwan has what it needs to defend itself, as we have been for decades across eight administrations. Um, and we will work with you and work with other members of the committee to make sure that we're doing that as effectively as possible. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I have another question here. Uh, sir, outrageous gas prices are hurting my constituents, yet the administration continues to attack American oil and gas. Put your microphone on, Mr. Jackson. Can you hear me? How about that? No? Okay. Uh, sir, outrageous gas prices are hurting my constituents, yet administration continues to attack American oil <coughs> and gas. Biden's price hike blame game is not only falling on deaf ears, but it's also not believable. Gas prices have risen each week since Biden took office due to this disastrous and ill-advised posture towards American energy companies. Beyond the failed domestic energy policies, it also seems that your department's policy towards our Gulf partners is failing. I was disappointed to see that National Security Advisor Sullivan approached the meeting with the Saudi Crown Prince in a way that offended the kingdom. This, in my opinion, is not the way to handle such relationships during a global energy crisis. My constituents ask me each day what the government is doing to lower their gas prices. So I'd like to turn that question to you, Mr. Secretary. What is your strategy to work with other countries, particularly our Gulf partners, to increase access to energy and decrease uh, the world's reliance on Russia, and, uh, on Russia oil and gas? Uh, it is very important. Secretary, to do that in writing. I've got to be strict on the five-minute rule because we've got so many folks that want to make sure that we I'll, get I'll follow up in writing with you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks, Chairman. I'd like to enter into the record uh, a letter to Secretary Blinken dated December 3rd, 2021, from both you and myself on the weapon sales to Taiwan and another to the Honorable uh, Gina Romando, Secretary of uh, Commerce, uh, dated July 12th, 2021. Without objection, I now recognize Representative Andy Kim of New Jersey for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for coming here. Just the other day, you mentioned uh, that Ukraine won the battle for Kyiv. And I guess I just wanted to ask you, do you assess that they're winning the war as a whole? Uh, the Ukrainians, as, as things stand, uh, well, let's first of all, let's, let, let's define winning. What's important is this. First, on Putin's own terms, 
His objective going into Ukraine was to erase its independence and sovereignty, to deny its existence as an independent country. And on that basis, thanks to the extraordinary uh, courage of the Ukrainians, he's already failed. Uh, I am very confident in saying that a sovereign, independent Ukraine is going to be around a lot longer than Vladimir Putin will be on the scene. So on that basis, uh, they are succeeding and uh, Russia is, is failing. Now, ultimately, how this plays out and uh, on what terms, that has to be up to the, Ukra the Ukrainians, the Ukrainian people, the government that represents them. We will support uh, whatever they want to do uh, going forward. There is a ferocious battle taking place right now across hundreds of miles in eastern and, and southern Ukraine. And the Russians bring a lot of firepower to that, but that's exactly why we and 40 or more countries around the world are making sure that the Ukrainians have what they need to deal with that. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and I appreciate that articulation. The reason I asked this question is because I was recently conducted a, a town hall in my district, and I was asked a question about how does the war in Ukraine affect us? Mm. How does it affect the people in Burlington County, the New Jersey 3rd Congressional mm. District? And they asked the question, just point blank, why should we care? And I guess I just want to ask you, if you were there with the, at the town hall with me, what would you say back to them? I guess I'd say two things. First of all, I think we should care because the brutalization of the country and what's being done to the Ukrainian people uh, by this uh, Russian aggression are horrific and simply as fellow human beings, we should care. But beyond that, this aggression is not only an aggression against Ukraine, it's an aggression uh, against the very basic principles uh, of the international order that were put in place to try to keep peace and security after two world wars, both of which drew the United States in. And those principles, like the importance of sovereignty, uh, of independence, principles like one country can't simply invade another, change its borders, and assert that might makes right, can't dictate to another country its policies, its future, its decisions. That's what Russia is committing aggression against. And if we allow that to stand with impunity, it's going to open a Pandora's box around the world where other countries may take note and take action. And we know from history that draws us in. Second, uh, or third, I guess I should say, we're actually seeing direct impacts of this aggression uh, around the world, way beyond uh, Europe, including rising food prices because of Russia's aggression, uh, energy prices uh, that have gone up. They've gone up more than a, a dollar at the pump since Putin uh, began to put this aggression together. Uh, so it is having direct impacts as well. I agree with a lot of that. And I think as we're considering this budget and thinking this through, I think it's really important. I'd like to work with you on how we define success to the American people. Mm -hmm. Because we, we spend a lot of time talking about what we're trying to do, but we don't always do as much as we need to to articulate why we're doing it and what we're trying to achieve. And so when I think through this, I very much agree with you that we're feeling like we're in this new paradigm shift moment where we're seeing these sacrosanct ideas and values of sovereignty being challenged by, blatantly by authoritarian governments around this world. Um, and I think this is an opportunity for us to reassert what American leadership is trying to signify that is and, and define what success can be. Now, a, a question, you know, going back to Ukraine is, you know, one measure of success is you said we won the battle for Kyiv. I know that you uh, announced that we're going to start having our diplomats go back. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could commit to us when we're to expect the embassy to open up and, and have Americans come back into Kyiv. Um, Congressman, we're working on that right now. And I can't, I can't give you a date certain, uh, certain because we want to make sure, obviously, that it's done in a way that um, looks out for their safety, their security, but we have diplomats back on the ground in Ukraine, literally as we speak, working on that. I would anticipate uh, that this will um, uh, play out over the next several weeks, but uh, we will be back in Kyiv uh, and the American flag will be flying over the embassy. And when we understand the challenges that we face with Russia, I think a lot of people also recognize, and I think the chairman mentioned it, you know, some of our bigger concerns in some ways are related to China about what comes next. I heard that there's going to be a comprehensive strategy being released sometime soon. I saw the president will be doing some travel, most likely, out to Korea and Japan. Uh, I want to just ask, uh, what would be the, the top thing that we wanted to raise with the new president of Korea if that's uh, when the president will go out there? Um, the partnership that we have with Korea, the alliance that we have with Korea. Again, unfortunately, Mr. Mr. I'm happy we'll to we'll have to do it in writing. Up right. Thank you. I have to be strict on this five minutes rule. So I, I tell <laughs> members to try to, if you know a question, try to get it out so that the secretary have a chance to answer it. I now recognize Representative August Fluger from Texas for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm currently in San Antonio. Uh, and what a momentous day this is. Mr. Secretary, 
uh, th this will undoubtedly be uh, the, the easiest question that I questioning that I offer um, in uh, in this session for sure. Uh, but but uh, what I wanted to do today was tell you thank you. Um, it is uh, with great pleasure that just a few hours ago on the tarmac uh, of an Air Force base in San Antonio that we welcome Trevor Reed back home uh, to the United States. The very first time that I questioned you, I asked if you would be committed to doing everything in your power to bring him home, and, and you said yes. And every single time that we've talked, I've mentioned his name to you, uh, and you've kept it at the forefront of your mind. I believe, uh, and there's many people on the committee, Colin Allred and uh, um, Joaquin Castro and other Texans, uh, Sheila Jackson Lee, that have helped out on the other side of the aisle. Um, and, and, and I believe all 435 representatives and every one of the 100 senators knows Trevor Reed, knows his story, understands the situation that he was in, uh, and brought awareness to this. And uh, I can't thank you, uh, the SPIHA team, uh, and, and your entire State Department for doing the right thing and, and ultimately putting patriotism over politics. Uh, and that's exactly what happened today. The reunification with his family was just tremendous. Uh, the joy on their face to see their son, obviously uh, very worried about his health uh, and, and that it's going to take some time to to heal, uh, to get back to good health. But his spirit uh, is strong. He's a fighter. He's a survivor. And I think it's an important day in our country. Uh, I'm going to use this word again, patriotism over politics. And there's many issues uh, that I'd like to bring up today and I'm not going to do that. I'm going to instead uh, tell you thank you. I, I would ask that you tell President Biden thank you for putting patriotism over politics and doing the right thing to bring Trevor home. I can't imagine uh, the tough decision that had to be made, but uh, you made it, uh, you did it, uh, and he's home. Uh, and, and I'd just like to give you a couple of minutes to respond to that um, and also to ask that we don't forget Paul Whelan and that we don't forget other people who are unlawfully incarcerated uh, in other countries. We should leave no American behind. Um, and it started with Trevor. I hope this momentum will continue. So, Mr. Secretary, over to you. Um, Congressman, first let me just say uh, right back at you. You and other colleagues have been relentless in working on, advocating for, uh, getting Trevor home. And your voice, your action, your engagement on this has been critical, too. And I'm so glad that you were there. Uh, to, um, uh, to take part uh, in the homecoming. And, and, and thank you for all of the uh, engagement and effort that you've made uh, over this long, long period of time. Uh, and it is gratifying uh, to, uh, to see that, uh, that he's home. Uh, and I really also have to join you in, in praising the extraordinary work of uh, Roger Carsons, uh, who handles these issues for us and for the President. State Department, our ambassador in, in, in Moscow, John Sullivan, and many others who worked on this, but finally and most importantly, President Biden, who made the decision uh, to do this. Um, but every American who remains arbitrarily detained anywhere around the world or held hostage remains on our minds and in our hearts, uh, starting with, uh, with Paul Whelan. And I want to commit to you and to every member of this committee that we will continue to be relentless in bringing every single one of them home. This is at the very top of my priority list. I have, in my judgment, uh, a couple of almost sacred responsibilities. One is, of course, to look out for the men and women of my department, but the other is to do everything I possibly can to bring home Americans who, wherever they are around the world, may be arbitrarily detained uh, or held hostage. So we will not relent in this, but to, again, to you, Congressman, thank you. Thank you for your partnership on this, but thank you for your leadership and everything you've done to make sure that we could get to this day. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member, both of you have been instrumental in this. I appreciate your leadership and your voice. Uh, Trevor Reed uh, is back on American soil. I'm proud to report that a Texan, a Marine, and a Patriot uh, has returned home. With that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. I now recognize Representative Sarah Jacobs of California, who is the Vice Chair of the Subcommittee on International Development, International Organizations, and Global Corporate Social Impact for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary, for being here with us today. Uh, I first want to thank you and the Biden administration for your announcement of the Global Fragility Act countries mm -hmm. 
I'm looking forward to its implementation, particularly in Mozambique and coastal West Africa, and I hope we can continue to work together on that. Uh, I also know that a lot of us will be asking you questions about Ukraine, and it's our job to do oversight, but I think it's first important to say that you and the Biden administration and President Biden have been masterful in how, they've, how you all have handled this crisis, making sure our allies are and remain united, making sure that our approach is strategic and thoughtful and weighing all the different calculations, including the risk of escalation. And I just want to say that I go to sleep feeling better every night because I know that President Biden and you all are leading the way here on this. Um, you know, one of the things I know we're all concerned about, and I'm sure you saw on your trip to Kyiv, is this question of war crimes and atrocities. And it's increasingly important that the international community comes together to hold Putin accountable. Thankfully, the ICC has announced an investigation in Ukraine, which I'm very supportive of. And I understand the Biden administration is currently undergoing a policy review of the ICC and whether to provide material support to this investigation. So, Mr. Secretary, does the Biden administration support the ICC's investigation in Ukraine? We do. And let me add very quickly that um, we welcome it. Uh, we're looking to see how we can support it. There are other critically important efforts at, uh, at accountability for these uh, war crimes and other atrocities that have been committed. Uh, that we're also supporting. The uh, Ukrainian Prosecutor General, she's leading uh, a major effort to do this, to document, to collect the evidence, to prepare prosecutions. We have our own experts working directly with her and her team. Second, because we got back on the Human Rights Council um, at the uh, United Nations, we were able to lead the effort to establish a commission of inquiry at the Human Rights Council uh, to do the same thing. We're also supporting uh, that. So along with the, the ICC, the Prosecutor General, uh, the Human Rights Council, some other investigations that are going forward, across the board, they will have our support. That's really great to hear, um, and I think it's important that we support all of them. Uh, in terms of the ICC, we know that there are certain laws on the books that seem to prohibit material support and funding. Uh, is that correct? Uh, there, there, are, there are laws on the books, but we found ways uh, in the past, and we're not a state party to the, the ICC. We do not intend to become one, but we have found ways in the past to support investigations. In fact, there's a prosecution going on right now of a Janjaweed from uh, Darfur that is in part the result of information uh, and support that we provided. Okay. Would it be helpful for Congress to waive some of these prohibitions for the purpose of an ICC investigation uh, for Ukraine? To the extent that we find that anything would be blocking useful support that we could provide, that, that was, that's something we should look at, yes. Okay, great. Well, I look forward to working with you on that, and I think you'll find a, a lot of support here in Congress to make sure we're doing everything we can to hold Putin accountable. I want to go to another part of the world. Um, the last two years have been particularly deadly across the Sahel, with attacks claiming more than 3,200 victims in Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger, and uh, an alarming trend of coups, many of which were carried out by U.S.-trained personnel. And this is despite U.S. and international investments, the vast majority in the form of security assistance in the region for roughly a decade. And that's why I, along with uh, my colleagues, including Chairman Meek, sent a letter to President Biden urging a new strategy for the Sahel. And as part of this letter, we requested an evaluation of security assistance and other efforts in the Sahel over the last 15 years. Does the department have the adequate resources necessary to carry out such a review? Uh, thank you for putting a, um, a flag on that, because I do think this is very important. And I share your concerns. We've seen uh, mounting instability. We've seen the coups that you've uh, alluded to in, in Mali and Guinea and Burkina Faso. Um, and uh, I think we have strongly felt the need for what, uh, what you've suggested and others have suggested is a more comprehensive strategy to approach this. And that's exactly what we've, we've put in place. And so, yes, security is obviously a critical component, but while it's necessary, it's, it's insufficient. Getting at the drivers of conflict, getting at uh, the lack of uh, effective institutions, public services, uh, the lack of inclusion for minorities and the marginalized, human rights abuses, other drivers, the strategy covers all of that, and it also makes sure that as we're uh, moving forward, we are looking hard at the programs that we have in place to make sure that they are effective, they're operating as they're designed to be. Uh, I believe we have the resources necessary in the budget to carry out that, that mission. That's great to hear. I know in uh, June 2020, the state OIG a report on the CT Bureau uh, was concerned that it would take seven years to fully comply with the department's M monitoring and evaluation standards. Um, so I would love to work with you uh, to make sure that we are giving you the resources that you need to be able to do this and that we are learning the lessons that we need to from these investments and actually reform our approach so that we are promoting our values and not only looking at short-term security, but our long-term priorities as well. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. General Lady yields back. 
I now recognize Representative Chris Smith of New Jersey, who is the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Africa, Global Health, and Global Human Rights for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, uh, Mr. Secretary. You know, Mr. Secretary, as you know, the mass exodus of women and children from Ukraine uh, has been in a, has been left many vulnerable to human traffickers, and we know that even at some of the points as they're coming across the border, people are saying, you know, I'll give you shelter, I'll give you food, uh, and yet it's an engraved invitation, frankly, to, uh, to another hell that they're escaping, and that is human trafficking. You know, as you may know, I'm the special representative for the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly uh, for Human Trafficking. I'm in almost daily contact with NGOs, governments, stakeholders uh, in the region. Uh, there was an OSCE hearing a, a few weeks back, and the, the collective sense was not enough is being done. Uh, but I do thank you that there is efforts being made to help groups like um, uh, IJM, the International Justice Mission. Uh, I would respectfully, and they haven't asked me to say this, but I will say it, hopefully they can get even more resources. Uh, a lot of the money that's going to UNHCR I don't think is getting into the trafficking uh, fight. Uh, even the representative for the UNHCR recently testified at the Helsinki hearing uh, that not enough is being done, and that's from his lips. Uh, so I think we need to take that very seriously. IJM, as you know, is really pushing hard for uh, protection officers who, uh, who can really help weed out uh, you know, where the threats are. You know, the, uh, and I would ask you, Mr. Consent, Mr. Sp uh, Chairman, to put these flyers, or at least a few of these flyers, which are really good, mm -hmm. uh, into the record. Uh, and they're from Poland, they're from Hungary, from uh, Romania, and they are in Romania. So I would ask if you could to take back uh, to try to step up a regional effort similar to what IJM is doing in Romania. Uh, it's, what they're doing is, is very efficacious, uh, cost effective, and I think it just needs to be done. So if you could bring that back and perhaps uh, uh, comment on it if you'd like. Secondly, on March 8th, I chaired a hearing uh, on the importance of declaring Putin and others war criminals, but Putin especially. Now I know the ICC has initiated an investigation uh, you know, I won't hold my breath how long it'll take. You know, they want to be thorough, and that's all important. Uh, but David Crane testified at the hearing that I had, and he was our special prosecutor for Sierra Leone, who put Charles Taylor behind bars for 50 years. Uh, and he said that there's another avenue, another route available to us, and that would be using the General Assembly, not the Security Council where there's veto power, as you know so well, but the General Assembly to stand up a tribunal and immediately indict Putin. People around them, including Lukashenko and others, may be harder pressed to be following and doing in a subservient way what he tells them to do if he's a war criminal and he's an indicted one at that. And finally, if you could, um, on April 18th, Congresswoman Salazar and I uh, did send you a letter expressing concern at reports that our embassy in Guatemala and the U.S. Department of State officials have been interfering in the appointment process for the next prosecutor general uh, for Guatemala and whether our embassy is complying with Article 41 of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. I asked uh, Deputy Secretary Sherman about this on April 6th. I haven't heard back, but I want to point out uh, that Pro Prosecutor General Poros uh, has been extremely helpful when it comes to extraditing criminals from Guatemala, 63 in 2021, including 54 drug dealers. Now Guatemalan social media is a buzz. And there appears to be a memorandum circulating that's entitled, quote, Engagement Plan on the Guatemalan Attorney General Selection Process, close quote, purportedly from the U.S. government. And I wonder if you can confirm whether or not that is authentic, and I certainly hope it's not. Thank you very much. Well, Thank you, Can I just start quickly by uh, applauding your longtime uh, effective leadership on dealing with the human trafficking, something that uh, I very much appreciate, and I also share the concerns that you've expressed. Um, uh, about this. This is something that we have been looking at uh, and that we have real uh, concern about. And in these situations, wherever they take place, but uh, here in, U in Ukraine as well, we have, as you know, five million people who are, who are refugees. There are another seven million who are internally displaced inside Ukraine. Um, I take the, I, I want to take this suggestion back and look at it. Uh, I think um, uh, trying to uh, make sure that we have a, a regional focus on this <laughs> makes good sense to me, and I'd love to come back to you on that Great, if I you. could. Um, second, with regard to um, uh, accountability, um, let me say this. Uh, we will look at anything and everything to make sure that we get there, uh, whether it is uh, tomorrow, uh, next month, next year, 10 years. There, there, it, 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 it will happen. Uh, you're right. Sometimes this takes uh, a while. But here's the, the most important point. Uh, those who committed atrocities and those who ordered them need to be held to account. 
and we will look at ways to do that. Um, I'm not aware, but I'll, uh, I'll come back to you if I can, uh, on the, uh, the question of Guatemala. Uh, I can say as a general matter, we are um, <laughs> very focused everywhere on making sure that there are independent um, prosecutors, uh, judiciary, et cetera, to make sure that um, countries can deal with uh, corruption, uh, can deal with uh, crime in, a, in an appropriate way. So uh, I, that's the direction that we always take. But let me, if I can, Thank look you. into this and come back to you. Appreciate it, sir. Thank you. Gentlemen's time, time has expired. I now recognize a representative Kathy Manning of North Carolina, who's the vice chair of the subcommittee on the Middle East, North, North Africa, and Global Council of Terrorism for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Meeks, and thank you, Secretary Blinken, for your service and for being with us again today. I appreciate the administration's extraordinary efforts to help Ukraine, including intelligence sharing and unprecedented coordination among our allies that have led to crippling sanctions, humanitarian assistance, and for providing Ukraine with $3.7 billion in U.S. military aid. However, I am very concerned by the prospect that Putin may try to widen the war in light of recent events, including ex explosions in Moldova's breakaway region of Transnistria, which I have visited and I recall very vividly having to go from Moldova through passport control as if we were entering mm -hmm. uh, a Russian country. My state of North Carolina and my community in Greensboro have long had strong partnerships with Moldova. So this is of particular concern to me. So Mr. Secretary, what is your assessment of the potential for Russian escalation into Moldova? And what are we doing to prepare and protect Moldova and to prevent a wider conflict? Thank you very much. And I appreciate your engagement on this uh, very, very much. Um, simply put, we are watching this uh, like a hawk. I was in Moldova myself um, some weeks ago. Um, another senior official from the department uh, was just there, our Assistant Secretary for Population, Migration, uh, and um, uh, Refugees. Uh, we have done a number of things, and we're very focused on this. First, um, because there's a tremendous strain, as you know, on Moldova as a result of the many refugees it's taken in. We want to make sure that it has the resources necessary uh, to deal with that. The Moldovan people have been remarkable. When, when I was there, I saw the yellow and blue um, all over uh, Moldova. Um, we just joined a pledging conference that Germany led. Uh, we've committed $100 million um, additional f in additional resources out of the existing funds to Moldova uh, to help it deal with a number of things, but in particular, uh, the humanitarian challenge that it faces now. Second, we have programs, including in this budget, uh, to do uh, things like help uh, Moldova bolster its cybersecurity, because this is one of the uh, ways it's under, uh, under threat, uh, economic stabilization and resilience so that it can uh, stand up effectively, uh, programs to counter disinformation, which, as you know, it's on the receiving end of. And also, critically, one of the good things that happened is there's now an opportunity to fully integrate Moldova's energy system with Europe's. Um, and that's moving forward. We have programs in place that are also in the budget to, uh, to work on that. Finally, we've been working with the UN and international agencies to make sure that they are dedicating the appropriate resources to help Moldova deal with a potential influx of even more refugees from Ukraine as this goes forward. Uh, but the budget uh, includes all of this and more, uh, judicial reform programs, independent media support programs, uh, energy security, infrastructure. Uh, in many ways, we are uh, doing that. But of course, we're also making sure that our European uh, allies and partners are focused on challenges and threats to Moldova. Thank you. Those are all things that Moldova will need. So I want to turn to a different aspect of this conflict. How is the administration working with non-NATO countries uh, to work with us to repel the Russian regression and to get them to agree that this destruction of another country, the, res the resulting fuel and food shortages, the instability this is creating, and the use of force to redraw borders sets a dangerous precedent that creates instability and leaves the world worse off. In particular, how can we get China to be part of the solution? This has very much been our message uh, around the world. And when Russia's aggression was mounting, uh, we made the case uh, to countries around the world, well beyond Europe, well beyond NATO, uh, or for that matter, our allies in, in, in Asia, that this actually directly affected them uh, because it was a direct challenge to the international order that they depend on. These principles that I talked about earlier uh, that uphold peace and security, that say one country can't simply um, attack another, try to change its borders by force, uh, take it over, assert that might makes right, 
uh, dictate its policies and approach. That's not only relevant to Ukraine, it's relevant to countries around the world. And if this goes forward with impunity, others will take note and may act on it uh, in ways that will be immediately detrimental to those countries. Part of the reason that 141 countries stood up at the United Nations against the Russian aggression and for Ukraine is because they realized that their own interests were potentially at stake. And we've seen that manifest itself again and again in the OAS recently, the Organization of American States. Uh, we led the effort to suspend Russia from its observer status. Countries there recognized the importance of standing clearly against Russian aggression. The UN Human Rights Council, we led the effort to suspend Russia from its seat. And that, uh, that vote succeeded uh, in, a, in a dramatic fashion. Again, countries well beyond uh, Europe and our NATO allies. So I think countries are getting the message. Last thing that I'll say very quickly, and we want to work on this with you, is we're seeing the effects, though, uh, on other countries of this, uh, of Russian aggression, food security in particular. And one of the things that we have to do is make clear that the reason that's happening is because of Russia, not because of our <laughs> sanctions, and to address the problem. Thank you. My time has expired. I yield back. Thank you. The chair recognizes Representative Steve Chabot, the ranking member of the Asia Subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, uh, I'm the, one of the uh, co-chairs of the Congressional Taiwan Caucus and have been for many years. And uh, I was actually in Columbus just last week where the state legislature in Ohio up in Columbus formed uh, their version of our Congressional Taiwan Caucus. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, Taiwan Friendship Caucus with them. They do a lot of business with, with Taiwan. Probably met with the uh, ambassador herself five or six times in the last month or two months or so. Um, and, and so I wanted to follow up with uh, uh, some of the questions that Ranking Member McCall had uh, relative to Taiwan defending itself, and specifically the fact that the supply chain issues are uh, one of the major holdups um, for arms deliveries to Taiwan uh, with some of the weapon systems uh, that they need. I understand they may not be expected to be delivered for a decade or so, and uh, you know that could be far beyond the time. We know that the PRC has been more and more active, more and more confrontational, more and more provocative. So we really do need to get them these weapon systems so it can actually potentially be uh, a deterrence. We don't want war, you know. We want to arm them, but we don't want those weapons to be used. We, we want peace. Um, th that being said, what, what specific action, and I know the, the rank member asked a question, um, what, what specific actions is the administration doing now or intend to do uh, to deal with these supply chain issues which have been so frustrating. No, thank you very much, and I appreciate your focus on this. I think it's very, very important. We, of course, have uh, generically a, many supply chain challenges that are affecting people in, 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 in their daily lives. Uh, I'll be, uh, in, the, in, the, in the next few weeks, actually, uh, helping to lead uh, a, a summit with the Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo, on internationally dealing with breaking through log jams in supply chains, both in the near term as well as for, for the long term. And of course, I think there's a tremendous adaptation that's going on now as we realize the importance, COVID-19 showed this to us, of building uh, resilient and more self-reliant uh, supply chains. That's going to take time, but it's something that we are intensely focused on. With regard to Taiwan uh, in particular, look, I think there are two things going on. First, there has been, as you know, uh, sustained effort over many administrations to make sure that we are making good on our commitments to help Taiwan defend itself. There have been about $18 billion in foreign military sales since 2017, another $2.5 billion in direct commercial sales that uh, administrations have approved. I uh, approve these things on a regular basis. We're work looking to see how specifically we can streamline this to deal with some of the problems that you've, you've pointed to, uh, to make delivery timelines shorter. But at the same time, there's another thing I want to emphasize, and I know you know this very well because you're uh, so focused on it. It's also vital that Taiwan strengthen its asymmetric capabilities uh, uh, to deter potential uh, aggression from Beijing. Um, reserve force uh, reform, uh, cost efficient, mobile, lethal, uh, and resilient uh, systems. And all of this would go to deterrence. And the reason that it's a particularly interesting now is because I think Beijing is watching very carefully what's happening in Ukraine. And they have seen what uh, Ukraine, Ukrainians have been able to do to repel the Russian uh, aggression. They've also seen the dramatic response of the world in terms of sanctions on Russia that's resulted from this. They've seen the flight of hundreds, eight, by my count, 800 companies from Russia. All of this is factoring in. But the, in a sense, the somewhat asymmetric response of Ukrainians to Russia is something that other countries are looking at. We'd welcome working with you, 
uh, on this and, and making sure that we can um, do this even more effectively going forward. Thank you very much. And I have a whole slew of other Taiwan questions to ask you, but I'm already running out of time. So uh, let, me, let me shift over to an unrelated topic at this point. Um, Mr. Secretary, um, I've been involved uh, with the issue of international child abduction mm -hmm. uh, for, well, this is my 26th year in Congress, so quite a few of them over the years. One in particular was a Cincinnati case. The country was Austria, and we had worked with the late Madeleine Albright on this one, and she was very, very helpful in this. And I was just approached this last week uh, in, in Cincinnati um, by a constituent uh, whose granddaughter um, uh, what, he's trying to get his granddaughter home uh, to the United States. They have they have custody, but unfortunately, the child was taken to another country. I don't want to go into the specifics of this, but I just wanted to say that my staff and I have already uh, been in touch uh, with the State Department, uh, and uh, I just wanted to commend uh, your people for being exceedingly professional, uh, very cooperative, and I I want to thank you and appreciate. Uh, uh, the State Department's cooperation on this matter, and I look forward to working with them in the, in the near future. Because as you know, these cases can be uh, heartbreaking, and uh, um, unfortunately, uh, you know, we've had quite a few cases where American children have been taken to other countries. And I've been to The Hague, and The Hague Convention, all that. Uh, I've only got a little time left, so I'll just turn it over to you, whatever just you'd to like say, to say. Thank you for raising that. This is something that is very near and dear to my heart. It has been for a long time. It's been reinforced even more as a, a relatively recent father with young children. Um, I have um, uh, gone directly to the leadership of countries, including as recently as a month ago, where we've had a parental child abduction case uh, and spent um, time and focus uh, on trying to get countries to do the right thing uh, to some, in many cases, countries are not part of the, the Hague Convention, mm. even so. They need to do the right thing, and in the, in the most recent case that I dealt with directly with a, a leader of that country, its own courts had actually ruled in favor of asserting the rights of an American parent, but the, uh, the, it hadn't, the decision was not implemented. We pressed them to implement it. I welcome working with you on this. This is, um, again, something that, that I feel very strongly on a personal level. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you. We'll go to Representative Schneider of Illinois next. For five minutes. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and Mr. Secretary. Thank you for joining us today. It's always wonderful seeing you. Um, I want to thank you and your team for your outreach and direct engagement as we navigate complex issues around the world, especially the Russian invasion of Ukraine, as well as developments in the Middle East, in particular the discussions with Iran and the advancement of the Abraham Accords. With respect to Ukraine, I am grateful for the leadership of this administration, as well as the leadership of Congress, and notably this committee. It's imperative that we continue to do all we can to deliver any and all necessary security, economic, and humanitarian assistance, and your diplomacy is clearly yielding results. We must demonstrate to Putin and the world that we must demonstrate to Putin that the world is and will remain united in not just stopping on Russia's unprovoked and illegal invasion, but reversing it and securing Ukraine's independence and sovereignty and helping U Ukrainians rebuild their country. Turning to Iran, as we have personally discussed many times, I firmly believe the only way to peacefully end Iran's nuclear ambitions is through diplomacy. But I also fundamentally believe that successful diplomacy requires a very real and fully appreciated commitment and capability to stop Iran from acquiring nuclear arms by any means necessary. And that clearly means that Iran and our allies must know that we would use our military force if all else failed. I think strong deterrence enhances our likelihood of diplomatic success. I'd also like to express my grave concern about the possible lifting of the IRGC's foreign terrorist organization designation and the role such a move may play in ongoing nuclear negotiations. The IRGC is, without a doubt, a terrorist organization. The IRGC's malign influence extends beyond its borders to Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, Gaza, and beyond. They are responsible for suffering, violence, and death, including the loss of many American lives. I sincerely hope you will not lift this designation. And of course, it's not just Iran's nuclear program, but the entirety of Iran's malign activities in the region and around the world that concerns me and threatens the U.S. and our allies. We must not forget about the Iranian regime's human rights abuses, ballistic missile program, and support for terrorist proxies outside its borders. Specifically for our ally Israel, Iran, Iran may be on the one-yard line with nuclear, its nuclear enrichment program, but they are also knocking at the door through proxies in Lebanon, Syria, and Gaza. I trust that the administration appreciates this 
reality, and as, as, it, as it assesses ways to thwart Iran's nuclear activities, we don't trade lessening one threat for dangerously expanding another. Counterbalancing the threats posed by Iran are the positive impacts and limited potential created by the Abraham Accords. Mr. Secretary, I, don't need, I know I don't need to tell you that American engagement in this region is crucial, and there is no better demonstration of American leadership than the role we have played in supporting peace agreements between Israel and her neighbors. First with Egypt and Jordan, and more recently the peace and normalization agreements with UAE, Bahrain, Sudan, and Morocco. In an otherwise dark world, normalization of relations between Israel and these countries is a very bright spot lifting the lives of the citizens of these countries and the region. These agreements have brought hope to everyone in the Middle East and North Africa and illuminate a path to peace and cooperation in the region. These agreements have already enhanced security cooperation, economic development, religious tolerance, and cultural exchanges, and we must continue to support and build upon this historic cooperation as you did when you were in the Negev uh, at the summit. I am proud to have authored the Israel Relations Normalization Act, and I'm grateful President Biden signed it into law. We must keep working on expanding these agreements, not only to create a more secure and prosperous Middle East, but also since it is an important tool in preventing Iran's malign endeavors. So with not much time left, I'd like to ask or give you the opportunity to expand on how the administration is addressing concerns about Iran, Iran's nuclear programs, Iran's nuclear other activities, but also the prospects for, for expanding the peace and prosperity of the Abraham Accords. Thank you very much, Congressman, and I appreciate your leadership uh, on the Abraham Accords. Let me just say very quickly, we strongly support them. We want to deepen them. We want to expand them. And that's one of the reasons that uh, I was just in Israel and, as you mentioned, at, in the Negev, and it was extraordinary. We had around the same table the foreign ministers from Israel, Bahrain, the United Arab Emirates, uh, Morocco, and Egypt. Egypt, of course, uh, the first to make peace with Israel, but then more recent uh, countries that have um, normalized their relationships with Israel. And there is a strong and deep agenda to uh, pursue cooperation across a whole wide variety of fronts among these countries. It's incredibly exciting to see. We've been um, working to accelerate that from almost day one of our administration, uh, including bringing uh, Israel, the UAE, and India together to do joint infrastructure projects, including uh, working directly with Israel and uh, the UAE on uh, religious coexistence, on water and energy projects, all of this because uh, these agreements have allowed relationships to change. And I'm happy to come back to you on, on Iran because I see our, our time is up. Great. Thank you. I look forward to the conversation. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, the chair recognizes Representative Perry of Pennsylvania. I thank the chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, welcome. It's good to see you. Thank you. Do you know the value of U.S. intellectual property theft annually by the CCP? Billions of dollars. I okay, so that. according to NBC, or correction, CNN, 300 to 600 billion dollars annually. How about, do you know how many Chinese students are studying in the U.S. versus U.S. students studying in China? Uh, it's dramatically disproportionate. 340,000 in the U.S., according to NBC, 2,500 mm -hmm. uh, U.S. citizens studying in China. Um, Mr. Secretary, knowing that multiple members of your firm West exec were being considered by the incoming Biden administration uh, just prior to um, uh, Mr. then Mr. Biden accepting the nomination at the Democrat National Convention. Your website at your company, West Exec, uh, said this state had this statement and continue to provide capability to and remain a trusted partner of the U.S. government while pr pursuing commercial activities in China and remain a trusted partner for DOD sponsored research grants while expanding foreign research collaboration, accepting foreign do donations and welcoming foreign students in key STEM programs. Mr. Secretary, this isn't meant to be uh, just because there are multiple people that worked at your firm, Avril Haines, Michelle Flournoy, Jen Psaki. Is that a potential conflict of interest? Is Because that was taken off your website literally just a, a, within a week or so of, of pre President Biden accepting the nomination. Is that potentially a conflict of interest? Um, Congressman, uh, what I can tell you is, of course, like any uh, nominee for a, a position in government, uh, you go through uh, intense I know. Uh, checks. Just wondering no, about taking down that those that information off the website. I have I have, I have no uh, recollection of what was uh, done or not done with. Uh, you didn't with you didn't order that website. to be taken down. Absolutely not. Somebody just did it on there. Let me ask you this. Um, 
Would it be a conflict if Hunter Biden traveled to China on taxpayer-funded plane to set up Bohai Harvest, as you know, I'm sure you're aware of it, which then poured money into a CCP surveillance company named MegV. Um, and if you're not familiar with that, it's a company whose equipment is used in East Turkestan. Uh, and it was also sanctioned by OFAC regarding their biometric surveillance and trafficking of, traffic, tracking of ethnic and religious minorities in China. And, and furthermore, Bohive Harvest under Hunter Biden also facilitated a $3.8 billion deal that transferred 80 percent of the world's most lucrative cobalt mines in the Democratic Republic of the Congo to a Chinese firm that uses children as young as four years old to mine cobalt. And, and furthermore, under Hunter Biden, uh, Bohai Harvest has uh, also invested in the CCP-owned China General Nuclear Power Group, which was blacklisted in 2019 for allegedly trying to acquire U.S. nuclear technology for the Chinese military. I'm wondering if that's, if, if you view that, traveling on that airplane, uh, which is funded by taxpayers and is, of course, official business, would that be viewed as a conflict? Would you view that as a conflict of interest? Uh, Congressman, um, I'm here to address the State Department budget. I know what you're To address yeah. our foreign policy. That's a political question. You're welcome to take that up in uh, any appropriate so, so you can't uh, answer whether you think it's a I'm not saying it even happened but if it I'm did not, would I'm it be not, a conflict of interest a, I'm not going to address a hypothetical okay uh, well if it did the budget I'm here to talk about our foreign policy since since security. it did happen at least the investments is it a conflict of interest again I am not is it moral would it be morally wrong um, I'm here to address the State Department budget. I'm here to address our foreign policy. I'm happy to would it hand, Would any of those things that I outlined for you, would any of them, would you, would you say they enhanced U.S. national security or Chinese national security? Again, I'm not going to uh, entertain hypotheticals. Uh, I'm not no, gonna, this isn't hypothetical. These I, investments were made. I have no, so, I so have no let's take Hunter Biden and Bohai no Capital basis. out of it I and just no say if these investments were made, would they enhance U.S. national security or Chinese national security? Again, I'm here to talk about our budget. I'm here to talk about our foreign policy. I'm happy to address Is, is this not foreign about. policy? U.S. investors helping the Communist Party of China beat the United States industrially. It, you know, the administration, the administration that you work for, God bless them, they say that we should all be driving an electric, electric vehicle, 80 percent of the, the contents of which are produced in China. This goes directly to that. Does it help China or does it help the United States of America, sir? Again, Congressman, you're asking political questions. You're welcome to ask those in uh, the appropriate fora for that. I'm here to talk about our Mr. budget. Mr. Chairman, I'm here I to yield talk the balance. About our foreign policy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Sometimes I wonder if anyone will ever ask the question about members of Congress who are personally invested in. Chinese companies engaged in surveillance activities. Um, let me, uh, with that uh, side comment, uh, call on Representative Andy Levin of Michigan. Thanks so much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for your tremendous work on Ukraine and so many other fronts. I'm going to get back to talking about the actual policy of the State Department and the budget. Uh, the president's budget calls for $275 million in support for Haiti, which is 46% more than last year's request, including funding to strengthen the capacity of the Haitian National Police, combating corruption, and strengthening the capacity of civil society. But as someone who's closely observed Haiti for 40 years, my concern is that these investments will do little to change the reality on the ground for the Haitian people if we're not seriously invested in supporting their uh, aspirations for a real democratic transition. The biggest obstacle to this, in my view, is the entrenchment of U.S. support for the de facto uh, regime of Prime Minister Ariel Henry and the corruption and gangsterization his rule represents. Uh, further, it seems to me that U.S. support is disincentivizing Henri from participating in good faith negotiations towards a transitional government. Do you believe the assistance I mentioned will create sustainable change and development in Haiti if the de facto prime minister has credible links with criminal gangs and corrupt actors 
and the Haitian National Police has been credibly accused of violence, such as the latest incident of firing at protesters who are demanding higher wages. And does the State Department believe its support for Hungary is making political dialogue among Haitian actors more likely somehow? Congressman, thank you. Thank you for your focus on this issue and, and for raising it. Let me say first that we have uh, deep concern about the security situation writ large in Haiti, the lack of a political accord for, uh, for elections, gang violence, uh, kidnappings, uh, homicides on the rise despite efforts uh, being made by the Haitian National Police that we're supporting. Uh, we are working with uh, a large number of allies with the Organization of American States uh, to address these, uh, these issues, uh, to press for more resources, for example, for the police, to try to deal with the gang violence. When it comes to the political situation, um, we are not taking sides uh, in the political dialogue. Uh, we're working with the government that's in place on an inclusive Haitian-led process uh, toward elections. That's the goal, and that's what we're supporting. Uh, well, we'll can I respectively submit, we have taken sides. It was the U.S. that said that Henri should be there when, he, uh, when there were, and we basically are what's, are the reason he's in power. And I just, I'd love it if you would be open to having a dialogue about uh, supporting the unbelievably robust and broad agreement in Haitian civil society, something I consider historic, sir. I've never seen anything like it in the post Duvalier era. And yet we say it's one among contending views. And, you know, I'd love to have a further dialogue with you about this, because I really think we're we're not on the right road here. I, I, welcome, be open I, welcome, I welcome pursuing that. OK, thanks. Let me let me then turn to another important country, uh, Colombia. Um, there were reports of a massacre of a massacre of civilians in uh, Putumayo, Colombia, by security forces that received U.S. security assistance. And this is very concerning. So if the U.S. trained security forces are found to have been involved, in my view, we ha they have to be cut off from U.S. assistance, and the Colombian government has to be urged to hold units accountable for these violations. Is the State Department committed to investigating these allegations and cutting off units from assistance from the U.S. if there is credible evidence of their abuses? And how will the State Department adjust future U.S. security assistance to Colombia, given these allegations. As you know, there's a long history of this kind of problems there. Mm. Uh, we take this very seriously. Uh, and of course, we'll look into any allegations. We're very serious about the uh, Leahy vetting process uh, that uh, uh, we have committed resources to, again, in our budget to make sure that we have uh, the means to always carry those forward. And if they're credible allegations, we will look into them. And if we find that the allegations uh, have substance, uh, we'll take action. All right, well, I look forward to seeing the results of your investigation that I appreciate that very, very much. I appreciate and I appreciate your commitment to human rights. Uh, let me turn to climate uh, change quickly. I'm glad to see that the president's request prioritizes addressing the climate crisis and proposes an integrated approach to tackling tackling its effects across our foreign assistance. I think the scale of the climate crisis demands a massive U.S. response both to demonstrate our potential to lead in the region and compete with other actors like China, but also to signal our resolve to addressing the legacy of U.S. emissions. One region that seems ripe for U.S. investments is the Northern Triangle, where we're trying to deal with migration issues anyway and where we know the effects of climate change are contributing to that migration and insecurity. And so my question is, how does proposed assistance for the Northern Triangle integrate climate concerns and what are the State Department's priorities for that region? Well, thank you. And first, let me just say more broadly, because I, I very much agree with you, um, the budget in total uh, provides $11 billion, in fact, a little bit more than $11 billion, to help countries uh, implement uh, targets, but also to help them adapt and to build resilience. Uh, and this is very critical in our own hemisphere, including in the Northern Triangle. We've engaged with many of these countries uh, at COP26 uh, and before that and, and, and since then. And so uh, these resources, if, um, if approved by Congress, uh, will go a long way to helping countries do this, uh, including uh, the Northern Triangle countries. At the same time, as we're looking at making infrastructure investments uh, and bringing others together, including using uh, the um, uh, Development Finance Corporation, 
working through the program that uh, the President established at the G7 that we've been calling Build Back Better World. Um, one of the focuses of that uh, program is, is to um, uh, support projects that strengthen infrastructure but uh, do it in a way that also uh, addresses uh, climate change challenges uh, and um, uh, that too uh, can be a focus of the work that we're doing. Um, finally, I'd say that uh, there are many other things that we're doing, of course, in the Northern Triangle countries, uh, partly to deal with migration challenges, but part of dealing with migration challenges is making sure that uh, we get at the root causes of what it is that is uh, causing people to um, give up everything they know and leave the, their countries and try to come to the United States or go elsewhere uh, in the hemisphere. And a big part of that, of course, is trying to create greater economic opportunity for them. Uh, we've been working on that, and the, these kinds of investments that are made to create a economic opportunity can also have a lens uh, on them uh, that looks at uh, energy, climate, infrastructure in ways that advance both agendas. Precisely. You know, <laughs> excuse me, as I, lead, as, as I yield back, I just, just imagine if we helped the Northern Triangle countries leapfrog straight to renewable energy generation and electricity for everybody, it would do so much to transform the root causes of migration, as you say. Yeah. Um, chair, I don't know who yeah. I'm yielding back to, but chair, whoever it is. Uh, chair, recognizes, I, chair recognizes uh, Representative uh, Issa of California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary, good to see you again. Uh, I wish we were seeing each other at a better time. Uh, the world is, is, is clearly in chaos. Uh, I, I don't mean to be glib, but one of the, the series of questions that I'll have today, really any part of, of the questions uh, related to JCPOA really ha will, by definition, include Russia. So trying not to be too cynical, how are, the, uh, how are those maneuvers in Belarus going with the Russian military? Uh, have they accidentally strayed into Ukraine? In other words, how is it that we can accept anything that involves Russia as an important verifier uh, and interlocutor at this time? No, I appreciate the question. And uh, when it comes, for example, to the JCPOA, this is not a quite, and Russia's participation in that, along with China, uh, along with the European Union, along with the United Kingdom, Germany, and France. Russia. The other countries I'm comparatively okay with. <laughs> I agree with you. Um, they don't have a role in verification. Uh, they, and if, uh, in the agreement that uh, we pulled out of, uh, had Iran been found to be in violation of the agreement, uh, under the terms of the agreement, the United States, together with the European Union and our uh, European partners, uh, had the rights uh, under that agreement without Russia or without China to hold uh, Iran to account. Any agreement that we might conclude would have the same thing. Well, to that end, the State Department has, has just published a report that's titled Arms Control, Nonproliferation, the Disarmament Agreements and Commitments. The report states that the United States has concluded that serious concerns remain outstanding regarding possible undeclared nuclear material and activities in Iran as of the end of the reporting period. I read that pretty straightforward. Iran cheated. Iran has, as we speak, unreported nuclear uh, materials, correct? Here's what uh, Iran has, Congressman, as we speak. Uh, Iran has a nuclear program that is galloping forward as a result of us pulling out of the nuclear agreement. Under the nuclear agreement, what, what, Iran what was had a breakout Mr. Secretary, time about I know, I know we pulled out of the nuclear agreement, but Europe didn't, correct? Uh, Europe did not, but Iran, so, uh, so Iran, 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 Iran was bound by an agreement with Europe, and Iran had had at that time undeclared materials. Has it as of right now? Correct. The IEA uh, has uh, been investigating and looking at any aspects of Iran's nuclear program that uh, remain in question. We fully support uh, those efforts, and they are separate and apart from uh, any nuclear agreement. Have you, as of today, have you clarified where those nuclear materials are located in Iran? The uh, IEA has identified places that it uh, uh, they'd like to look that at. They want that they uh, want to look at, and part of the part of the result of the agreement in the first place was Iran uh, taking on the additional protocol, which enhances inspection rights, including for the IEA. 
And I would also note that the inspections regime oh. under the agreement was the most intrusive inspections regime of any arms control agreement ever adapted, which gave question, us great I'm visibility into so what Iran was doing. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Secretary, the last agreement was not brought to uh, Congress under the treaty requirements. Will you commit to bring this one as a treaty? Uh, Congressman, we will commit to following the law, including INARA. Okay. So it's fair to say you're not going to bring this for ratification as a treaty? Uh, again, we'll follow the law. Uh, INARA has requirements. We'll meet whatever requirements INARA has. This is the law that, that, that we yeah, No, no, I understand. I, 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 the reason I ask is the American people really don't know every acronym. They do understand that Senate ratifies treaties and that under that law there will not be a Senate ratified treaty. The vast majority of uh, multilateral agreements in the arms control and nonproliferation space are not codified as treaties. It actually gives us much greater flexibility if there is uh, any kind of cheating or reneging on those agreements uh, if they're not. Pursuant to the renewal of the, uh, the, this JCPOA, one of the portions of it would be that Russia would receive uh, a $10 billion contract to produce an, uh, a nuclear facility, basically. Will you commit that Russia and th will have no part and you will not lift any sanctions against Iran or Russia until the Ukrainian conflict has been satisfactorily resolved. In other words, this agreement would give Russia $10 billion from an Iran that has access to the money to give them. Will you commit not to do that, for that not to take effect uh, until after a satisfactory resolution for the people of Ukraine? Uh, any actions that Russia would be called upon to take pursuant to the agreement would not be in contravention of the sanctions that are being imposed on Russia. Well, but those, those particular $10 billion, uh, I, I can't say whether they're covered. I know, I just need a second to finish as the previous one did. I just want to know, would this be under those sanctions in your opinion? Uh, and we, of course, will make sure that uh, lawyers look at everything, uh, but uh, the actions that Russia would take pursuant to the agreement, if there's a return to the agreement, uh, would not be in contravention of the sanctions imposed on Russia for its actions uh, in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The chair now calls on Representative Vargas for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for being here. We appreciate it. I do want to congratulate you because I do think that our standing with our allies and our friends around the world is very high now, not only because of what you've done and with the president, but I'd also throw in Secretary Austin. I don't think he's been mentioned here enough. I think he's done an outstanding job. So I want to congratulate you. I have a very quick question and then a series of questions. The quick question is, uh, I represent the area of San Diego, and we've had a number of Ukrainians that have been able to come through Tijuana to San Diego, and we've uh, done everything we could, could to, to, uh, to receive them. And I think that the federal authorities have done a pretty good job but now since you've changed the rules, uh, which is good and we're all in favor of that, um, there are some people that are stuck now in Tijuana, Ukrainians that flew to Mexico City mm -hmm. and are now in Tijuana. Um, what can you do to help these poor people make sure that they can reunite with their families in the United States? A um, couple of things on that, Congressman, and thank you for, uh, for flagging it. First, uh, yes, we have had a number of Ukrainians who've come uh, through um, Latin America into uh, the United States. Um, they've been paroled in uh, for, for the most part. The overwhelming majority of Ukrainians who have uh, had to flee the country are, of course, in, in Europe. Uh, they are mostly uh, intent on remaining close by because they, they want to go home. And as soon as they're able to, many of them have left uh, sons, husbands, fathers there to fight. As soon as they're able to, they want to go home. For any uh, remaining Ukrainians, um, the President's uh, made a couple of commitments. He's committed. Uh, that uh, we will welcome uh, 100,000 Ukrainians into the United States. We've just, as you noted, established uh, a new program to facilitate that, along with the refugee program, along with the uh, asylum program. We now have a program that allows for sponsorship of Ukrainians by uh, any American. They can, uh, Ukrainians can apply for that from any of uh, our embassies um, uh, in Europe uh, and around the world. If there are any remaining individuals in this situation, of course, we'll make sure that we're uh, working to address that. Oh, okay, those, those are the ones I'm concerned about. Now, I, I don't normally agree with my good friend, uh, Mr. Issa, but I do agree with him on this JCPOA. I have great concerns, and one of the things that you just said concerns me significantly, and that is that 
Iran is now galloping mm -hmm. towards a nuclear bomb or a nuclear program. Um, Let me be specific. Yeah, please do. Toward having the capacity to produce fissile material on short notice for a nuclear weapon. The agreement put that ability to, to, so, to break out, in other words, to produce fissile material weapon at beyond one year. As a result of the actions that they've taken since we pulled out of the agreement, uh, that breakout time, as we call it, uh, is down to uh, a matter of weeks. That's right. what I meant. And, and that's very concerning, of course, to all of us. Mm -hmm. Now, the JCPOA was very concerning to me, and I did not support it because of the timelines. Uh, we, they weren't permanent restrictions. Things rolled off. Now that we're negotiating them again, you say that it's going to be stronger and better. Mm -hmm. Could you give us some information on where this is and what that means? What uh, we inherited was a failure, a failure to actually curb Iran's nuclear program, a failure to curb its malicious activities throughout uh, the region. As I noted, uh, while the agreement itself uh, put the nuclear program in a box and pushed the breakout time to beyond a year, in the absence of that agreement, Iran has taken steps to cut that breakout time down to a matter of weeks. At the same time, despite the maximum pressure being exerted against Iran, which we were told would cause them to curb their malicious activities in the region, we've seen them accelerate. Um, to give you one example of this, um, during the time the agreement was first negotiated back in 2012 through 2018, when we pulled out of the agreement, attacks on Americans, our diplomats, our forces in the region, had gone down to virtually zero. Since we pulled out of the agreement, uh, the IRGC uh, was designated as a foreign terrorist organization. Soleimani, for whom no one is shedding a tear, uh, was killed. Those attacks have gone up uh, 400 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, our ability to, uh, under the po previous policy to deter Iran, clearly was not succeeding. So uh, we're focused on how we can be most effective, both in dealing with the nuclear program and our commitment to ensure that Iran never acquires a nuclear weapon, but also to dealing with the malicious activities that it's engaged in throughout the region, including support for terrorist groups, various proxies uh, that are threatening allies and partners, et cetera. That's what we're focused on, uh, and we want to make sure that, uh, unlike what we inherited, we're able to do that more effectively. And, and I guess my concern is that we do have to refocus once again, because I remember what happened in North Korea when we said that uh, hmm. because of the deal that we had, they'd never have a nuclear weapon. And we woke up one day and they had one. And so, again, my concern here is that that's going to happen in Iran. So, again, I, I thank you, and I, I hope we be, remain vigilant. I yield thank back. You. Thank you. We'll go to Representative Adam Kinzinger of Illinois next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here. Um, I know it's a little bit going on out there, and I appreciate your time. Uh, just a quick thing on the JCPOA that's been discussed. I, I think it is worth noting there are provisions of the JCPOA that would be expiring now had we stayed in it. And uh, I think it's important when we talk about the future, in foreign policy time, like 10 years actually is pretty quick. And, and so that once, I want to pivot a little to Ukraine from that perspective. First off, I want to say thank you to the administration for changing your tone. I think it's become clear over the next few weeks that the administration is clear-eyed about the seriousness of this threat. I was concerned with some of the uh, some of the wording early on, but uh, it does appear as we've doubled down our commitment. I mean, it, it's very clear to me that Ukraine, and I think you've said this too, sir, Ukraine is fighting for all of us. Uh, they happen, we have to arm them because they are fighting for all of us. And I think it's important for people to remember, if Ukraine falls, and I think we're doing the right thing by stressing our commitment to NATO territory, and I actually really do believe that if Vladimir Putin moves in on NATO territory, he would be met with a devastating response. But I think it's important for people to remember, there's a lot of real estate still that's not in Ukraine that's not part of NATO. And that's why it's important right now for us to make sure that Vladimir Putin can go no further. And I hope he loses some of his occupied territories. Just a couple of legitimate questions that I want to know the answer to, uh, believe it or not. I want to ask first off about uh, a month ago, it was reported that there might have been the use of chemical weapons uh, in Ukraine. I wondered if you had an update on that in, in terms of what we know. Thank you. Um, and some of this may be more appropriate to take on in a, in a different setting. But, but having said that, this is something we're looking at very, very carefully. I don't believe that we've been able to verify uh, the, uh, that use, but uh, I want to come back to you. Uh, there are different kinds of chemical agents uh, that, that could be in play, including uh, riot control agents that would be uh, prohibited, that kind of thing. But in terms of uh, the use of a chemical weapon, 
Um, I think what I can say here is that we've not yet verified the use, but it's something that we're very, very much focused on. Thank you. Uh, next question is the use of, uh, you know, for American aid, to the extent we can answer this in this setting, um, what is the prohibition, what is the reason for not basically flying American aid directly into Ukraine versus through proxies? Is it an international law issue? Is it a safety issue? Is it infrastructure? I'm curious if you can answer that. I think first the most important thing is the aid is getting in, right. getting in in record time. It yep. used to be, for example, under presidential drawdowns, it would often be weeks between the time the president made a drawdown decision and the aid got into the hands of those who needed it. I was just there, as you know. Uh, including at the staging site for where some of this aid is getting in. Uh, and it's down to, in some cases, 72 hours. That's how rapidly it's getting in. So I don't think we have a, an issue right now with um, the assistance not only being provided, but actually getting to where it needs to get. Once it gets to the, the border and it's handed over to the Ukrainians, they're the ones, of course, who uh, are getting it where it needs to go. They know this a lot better uh, than we do, and they've been extremely effective in making sure that uh, these supplies could get uh, where it needs to get. And let me ask you about the, the Air Force side of things. Um, one of the, I believe one of the programs we used to do through the Air National Guard, I remember the Air National Guard, uh, we would pair with Ukrainian Air Force, we'd do fake fights, train each other, yep. we'd train them to fly. Has there been any consideration to restoring those programs, bringing Ukrainian pilots potentially to American Air Force bases to learn to fly? Because mm -hmm. I mean, yes, it takes a long time to train a pilot, it does. Um, because we're so good, but uh, it takes a long time to train a pilot, but there's no time like now to start. So I wanted to ask you about that. Um, I, I agree with the, with the general proposition, and indeed we're, we are moving forward um, on, on training, because here's one of the challenges. Um, the, some of the systems that the Ukrainians would like to have uh, that could be effective in repelling the Russian aggression and defending the country are systems that they're not trained on, and it does take some time. Uh, the Pentagon, and I think Se uh, Secretary Austin referred to this the other day, uh, is engaged uh, in some training. So are other allies and partners in Europe. I can't address this, that specific program. The Pentagon would have to address that. But generically, uh, yes, we're engaged in training. And I'll just say to, to wrap up, I think, you know, it takes a lot to change an army from Warsaw, Warsaw equipment basically to NATO equipment. I think with what we're seeing with our allies and donating some of the old Soviet equipment is actually helping to accelerate that process to switch over to NATO standards. So thank you, Mr. Secretary, and I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, chair now recognizes Representative Jim Costa of California. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Secretary. Uh, I want to thank you. I, I, I generally, I think we've detected a, a, a good bipartisan effort taking place uh, in terms of uh, supporting our efforts in Ukraine. And we want to see that continue. Your mission uh, with uh, Secretary Austin was, uh, by all accounts, uh, successful. And the president's announcement today in terms of the additional funding, I think, uh, really uh, underlines that incredible strong commitment we're making to Ukraine and, and really providing the leadership uh, as it relates to NATO. Tell me, how did your discussions, uh, uh, if you drill down a bit deeper, go with our, our NATO allies for the longer term commitment. And certainly the president's statement today, I think uh, provides that leadership, but um, I think eyes clearly wide open. We're gonna be in here for the long haul and I wish to, uh, you'd give a little more descriptive for that. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate that and I agree with you that this is likely to be a long haul proposition. That's exactly why we have been uh, relentlessly focused on working every single day with allies and partners on every aspect of this, making sure the Ukrainians have what they need to defend themselves, making sure that we continue to impose massive consequences on Russia uh, for this aggression, uh, making sure that we're also shoring up our own alliance, uh, NATO, so that it is properly postured to deal with any Russian aggression directed at it. And this is being done, Congressman, literally day in, day out. On the specifics of security assistance to Ukraine, I think I, I may have mentioned this earlier, um, after Secretary Austin and I visited uh, with the uh, Ukrainian government, with President Zelensky in Kyiv um, over the weekend, um, Secretary Austin then went on to Germany to uh, chair a conference that he had convened that involved ministers of defense from 40 different countries to make sure that we are moving forward on coordinating and providing the security assistance that, uh, that Ukraine needs. Uh, so well, I think that's a very, 
important point and obviously one that needs to continue. I participated in the past with NATO parliamentary assemblies as recently as in February. And frankly, it's only gotten, I think, better, but it's the strongest I've seen NATO uh, react since the Cold War time period. Uh, speaking of which, uh, the world's changed in the last two months in ways that we could never anticipate two months ago. Uh, can you give us a status on the update of Finland and Sweden uh, becoming a part of, of NATO? You're right. The world has, uh, has changed pretty dramatically, and one of the ways it's changed uh, is in the very strong interest of both countries to uh, become members of NATO. Um, we, of course, look to them to make uh, that decision. Uh, if that's what they decide, we will strongly support it, uh, and we will work, and including working with, um, uh, with the Any government. idea on, on a timeline? Um, I, I, I can't give you a timeline. I think it's under, let me put it this way, it's under very active consideration. Uh, by both countries. Uh, there's a, a NATO summit, as you very, know very well, coming up uh, soon. So I, I would anticipate that um, uh, we'll hear more about that uh, by the time of the summit. Let me move on. Um, it's in the neighborhood, but a, 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 a separate matter. Um, the uh, situation with Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, has uh, been very frustrating. Uh, and. I don't believe Azerbaijan has lived up to their agreements. And certainly uh, we've learned a lot of things in the last two months, but uh, Russia clearly is not good at keeping their word uh, uh, with the uh, war criminal who is heading the country today. Um, what can we expect for additional support for Armenia and, and trying to hold Azerbaijan to the commitments they made uh, in the truce uh, settlement? Yeah. Uh Congressman, this is something that I've been very engaged on, including uh, throughout the, uh, the Ukraine situation. I've spoken repeatedly with uh, Prime Minister uh, Pashinyan from uh, Armenia, as well as President Aliyev from Azerbaijan, uh, trying, first of all, to make sure that um, uh, no one takes any steps that would um, uh, potentially uh, revert to, uh, uh, to conflict, uh, but also to try to advance uh, and support a long-term uh, political settlement and, and by the way, we still have a, our status as a Minsk Group uh, co-chair. Uh, we've been developing and promoting uh, confidence-building measures. Uh, and again, I've spoken repeatedly to, to both leaders as well as uh, the foreign ministers. Our budget has uh, $45 million of assistance in it uh, for uh, Armenia. Uh, Two million of that is, is for demining. which For demining, uh, right. And we need to do more. <laughs> and we, we're happy to work with you uh, on all of that. Okay. Um, my time has just about expired, but I was wondering about after the last administration hollowed out much of the, the State Department's capacity, how it's going in terms of rebuilding your ability to do the diplomatic missions you have around the world. Well, thanks to the support that we've gotten from Congress, including in the last budget, uh, we, we're making very good progress on that. Uh, the budget that we put forward now uh, would allow us to keep doing that and to keep uh, strengthening the Department, including by bringing in uh, new personnel, including by strengthening uh, our missions abroad in, uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, so we very much hope that um, members of Congress will, will support the budget, take a hard, hard look at it, because it does go a long way to enable us to modernize the department and to make it stronger, more agile, more effective in advancing our diplomacy going forward. Mr. Secretary, stay with it, my friend. We're Thank all in this together. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, the staff have informed me that we may need to place another microphone in front of you for better pickup. So we're going to take just a few seconds Perfect. to do that. And or do I just need to that way you can, yeah, no, you don't have to do anything. All right. Okay. This Thank way you can continue to speak softly while we carry a big stick. So, uh, uh, a great progressive <laughs> and Republican. Uh, I uh, will now call on Representative Zeldin of New York. Mr. Secretary, thank you for, for being here. I wanted to follow up on some of the questions and comments brought up earlier related to uh, the Iran nuclear deal, the JCPOA. When Secretary of State John Kerry was here, sitting where you are nearly seven years ago, uh, he was asked about uh, why it wasn't submitted to JCPOA, why the JCPOA wasn't submitted to Congress as a treaty. And he essentially was stating that the reason why it wasn't submitted was because of difficulty getting it passed. Uh, now this is relevant again as the Biden administration may be entering into a nuclear deal with Iran. Why wouldn't this be a treaty? As I, I think, thank you, Congressman. Uh, I think as I noted uh, 
a short while ago, uh, many, in, in fact, most uh, arms control nonproliferation agreements that are multilateral in nature, as this one is, are actually not submitted to treat as treaties. If you go back through the long history of that, uh, many are not. Yeah, I'm, I'm asking is, why not. I'm asking why wouldn't a, a nuclear deal similar to the JCPOA, why would that not be a treaty? Because in many instances, uh, doing it uh, in the way that uh, we would do it gives us much greater flexibility to make sure that if, for example, there's a violation of the agreement by the Iranians, we can act quickly uh, to deal with that. And why wouldn't those. it be a treaty? Again, Le legally. Well, what's the definition? Do you know what a treaty is? What's a treaty? So the legally uh, required obligations undertaken by both parties to, uh, to an agreement. So how, how would this not be a treaty? Under, under the definition you just provided, see, the thing is, is that you would then have to submit this to Congress, and then it would have to be ratified. And then it's non-binding if that doesn't happen. But the definition that you just provided, which is one that I, I would agree with, mm -hmm. means that this is a treaty that under the United States Constitution would then get submitted to Congress for ratification. Uh, okay, uh, Mr. Vargas was asking you about uh, the sunset provisions. Uh, that was a, a good question, good point. I share his concern. Are you going to agree to a nuclear, is it possible you would agree to a nuclear agreement that doesn't change the sunset provision dates? Congressman, the situation that uh, we inherited is such as that, as I mentioned, uh, Iran is moving vigorously forward on its nuclear program to the point that it's breakout time. I, I heard your answer. I so, appreciate, but, but the so, question is, would you agree to a nuclear deal that does not change the sunset provision dates? We uh, are looking at getting back into mutual compliance with the agreement. Uh, that includes the various provisions that were in the agreement from the start, including the sunsets, the most important sunsets in the agreement, that is on the stockpile that Iran is allowed to have of uh, material and the processing um, speed of the centrifuges uh, and enrichment uh, capacity, those uh, provisions remain in place for almost another decade. Uh, the history of arms control agreements in the past. I, I don't want the history of arms control agreements. I want to know if you would agree to a nuclear deal that does not change the sunset provision dates. Uh, we, uh, without getting into the d discussion. I mean, it's a yes or no. Is the, is the answer yes, you are willing to enter into a nuclear agreement that does not change the sunset provision date? The, an the answer is quite simply that uh, what we are seeking to do is to get back into mutual compliance with the agreement, the agreement that was reached uh, seven I, years ago, we're, we're including looking for some the, straight including answers the provisions here. that are in that agreement. Th and those include the, su the sunset provisions. W but, but would you be willing to enter into an agreement that does not change the sunset provisions? And if you're not able to say yes or no to that, uh, we're not going to assume that you're there fighting for a change to the sunset provisions because you're not even telling us that. Why would we expect that you're drawing a tougher stance on the Iranians than you're willing to say to uh, Congress and to the, to the American people? Um, uh, uh, you said that you're going to follow a uh, NARO. W does that mean that you would submit the entire agreement? Uh, the lawyers will, will, will look at that, are looking at that. If they make a determination that under INARA uh, there are requirements that we have, of course uh, we will follow those. Uh, so you can't make a, a commitment that you would submit the entire agreement? Um, I can tell you again that we will follow the law and we will follow INARA I, I, and whatever, uh, whatever it requires. Are, are you saying do. that, I, you, okay, whatever, let's say your attorneys tell you that you don't have to submit the entire agreement. Would you commit to us that you would submit the entire agreement to Congress anyway? Um, we will follow the law. You're not willing to make a commitment that you'll uh, submit the entire commi agreement? My commitment is to follow the now, law. Now, under INARA, the clock starts once the entire agreement is submitted. So the clock for reviewing it then wouldn't start, correct? Um, again, what I can tell you and what I can commit to, as always, is we will follow the law, including, of course, INAR. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know, and this is not the right saying to get into the, uh, the reports of added security for your predecessor and, uh, and other issues. We are very concerned uh, about that, uh, and especially with regards to negotiations with Iran, uh, and, and how that relates, it just, just know that there's a massive concern with negotiating with Iran while that uh, may be ongoing to the extent of a conversation that we can't have here. I yield I, back. I appreciate that. I'm happy to follow up in a different setting with you. Representative Jerry Connolly of Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Secretary. Welcome. And thank you for all you're doing for the Ukrainian people. Um, it was a pleasure and a privilege to meet with you when I was in Poland and Ukraine, and uh, I have been so proud of our government uh, in its 
very strong response, and I know the Ukrainian people understand that and appreciate it as well. Um, since so many want to talk about the JCPOA, let me ask you, you were in the Obama administration as well. Is that not true, Mr. Secretary? It is. Would it be a fair statement to say that between 2011 and 2015, the Obama administration exercised maximum sanctions pressure on Iran that almost led to its economic collapse. Would that be a fair statement? I don't know if I'd go as far as to say economic collapse, but I can certainly say that, yes, it exerted maximum economic pressure, and uh, significantly, and during we that had already, uh, the United States had been engaged in that. We brought other countries along to right. do exactly that. And during that time period, did we succeed in cutting Iranian oil exports by 50 percent? We did. And would it be fair to say that perhaps some causation, because of that four-year sustained effort by the United States government under the Obama administration, Iran might have been motivated to come to the negotiating table that ultimately led to the JCPOA? Right. That would be my judgment. That would be a fair thing. So once we did agree with the U.S.-led set of negotiations in kind of an extraordinary thing with China, Iran, Russia, and the Europeans plus us at a table, are, we let it, and we get an agreement for the first time. Iran says, yes, we'll do this, understanding that it pushes them further away from the development of a nuclear weapon. Is that correct? That is correct. Would it be fair to say, for example, let's look at the elements of the JCPOA. They were required to cover up, you know, stop uh, the functionality of the plutonium production reactor. Is that correct? That's correct. And did they? They did. They did. And did the IAEA and the U.S. government certify such? Both did. Were they required to reduce the enrichment of uranium to 3.67 percent? They were, and they did. And did they? they yes. Well, don't jump on my line Sorry. here. So they, <laughs> and they did that. Is that correct, Mr. That Secretary? Is, that is correct, Congressman. And were they required to ship out any enriched or stockpiles of enriched uranium that went beyond that? They were. And did they do that? They did. Did they allow inspections, including unannounced inspections, of facilities that the monitoring group uh, felt they needed to inspect? They did. They did. Is there any metric contained in the JCPOA they violated? To the best of my knowledge, um, they adhered to their obligations under the agreement to the extent that those were called into question and the agreement had in it provisions uh, when uh, there was uh, a concern that they were not right. in the um, and, and we heard, the agreement. And Mr. Secretary, we, we heard that this body, before JCPOA went into effect, all kinds of predictions about Iran would cheat and so forth. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, they didn't. They didn't. That's a fact. They met the terms of the agreement, and, th and by doing so, did they push back their ability to develop a nuclear weapon? They did. By how much? The breakout time, that is the time needed to produce enough fissile material for one nuclear weapon, was pushed back to beyond a year. And where are they now, Mr. Secretary, that we walked away from that agreement that was working? By public accounts, a few weeks. So that's not progress. Uh, it's the reverse of progress. So maybe one could say people who say they don't want a nuclear Iran but are opposing the revival of a nuclear agreement based on JCPOA, but with other provisions, might actually unwittingly, I'll assume unwittingly, actually be achieving the very opposite of what is desired. I would just say this isn't a theoretical exercise. We've seen the world with the JCPOA. We've seen the world without the JCPOA. With but the JCPOA, the nuclear program was put in a box. Without it, it's escaped from the box. And, and you and I would agree that, you know, Iran's a bad actor. There is no doubt about that. Do we, is it our habit when we have weapons agreements, including especially nuclear weapons agreements, that we, it's all encompassing in terms of behavior, that it includes all malign behavior, not just nuclear? That's what we did with the Soviet Union, for example. Isn't that what we did? Uh, this agreement was focused exclusively on Iran's nuclear activities and in, in no way took away our ability or the ability of anyone else uh, to push back hard against their other militia. And activities. my only point is, and that's precisily what we did with the Soviet Union. That's it, what we did with the Soviet Union. And indeed, it's what we continue to do with Iran. Even when, when the agreement was in force, we continue to take actions in coordination with others to deal with the other malicious activities. Thank that you, engaged. Mr. Secretary. My time is up. Thank I you, appreciate it.
chair now recognizes Representative Ann Wagner of Missouri. I uh, thank the, the chair, and I also want to thank Secretary Blinken for his time today and certainly for his service and for meeting uh, extensively with our foreign affairs delegation, sir, when we were in Poland uh, some weeks ago. Uh, on a different topic, Mr. Secretary, I co-chair the Congressional Caucus on ASEAN. It's a, the Association of Southeast uh, Asian Nations. And one, uh, uh, one fear I have heard time and again from Southeast Asian leaders is that the United States is ceding the Indo-Pacific to China. Our partners are desperate for the United States to demonstrate strength uh, and leadership in the region and they are deeply concerned that without robust U.S. engagement, Indo-Pacific countries will grow ever more reliant on the People's Republic of China. My Southeast Asia Strategy Act, which is now law, will send an unmistakable message of American resolve and leadership uh, to the region. In the meantime, we have an opportunity to make our case that we must remain the region's partner of choice, and I hope that the U.S.-led Indo-Pacific Economic Framework announced this past October will serve as a roadmap for the future of a free and open Indo-Pacific region. I worry, however, that the administration is letting this, this, this moment slip away by refusing to offer our partners transparency and frankly, candor regarding who and what will be included in the, in the framework. Mr. Secretary, I am particularly concerned uh, that Taiwan is being shut out of the Indo-Pacific economic framework. Even though the administration may try to kind of hide this by never formally closing the door, so to speak, to participation, Taiwan's offer to become a full member is not being accepted. When our country's top trade negotiators met last week, this was Taiwan's number one and top request. But the Biden administration did not allow Taiwan to join the framework. Uh, this policy is, is self-defeating and dangerous, frankly. Uh, Taiwan was our eighth largest trading partner last year and one of our largest, certainly, in, in Asia. President uh, Tsai's administration has even changed Taiwan's domestic law in hopes of starting uh, free trade negotiations, which the administration is also refusing. As a, a rule of law democracy and a top global trading partner, Taiwan should be certainly a top priority for the framework. But instead, this administration is, is marginalizing Taiwan and showing the Chinese Communist Party that the United States is deterred from working with a critical partner. Can you explain, Mr. Secretary, how the administration arrived at this policy? Because it truly does not make, uh, make any sense. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, let me just say it was great to be with you in, uh, in, in Poland, and very important that, uh, that you were there with, uh, with other colleagues. Um, on this question of the Indo-Pacific uh, Economic Framework, uh, there, there, there is no such uh, uh, policy in the extent that this, this agreement is going to be open, it's going to be inclusive, and we're just in the process of launching it, including beginning conversations uh, with a, a number of countries as potential partners, and there is nothing that is closing the door uh, on anyone, including, uh, including Taiwan, and, and we're just getting this off the ground. It has a number of important, um, uh, I think, opportunities that uh, will bring us together and assert our uh, economic leadership uh, in the region, trade facilitation, uh, working on standards for the digital economy uh, and technology, supply chain resilience, uh, infrastructure investments, worker standards, uh, et cetera. So we're, at, we're just at the starting point, and again, uh, it's going to be open, it's going to be inclusive, uh, and I imagine we're going to be engaging virtually every country um, in the region. Well, I'm very glad to hear that, and I certainly um, I hope that we can send something more reaffirming to our Taiwanese partners, uh, given their, their trade status and our, our relationship there. I, I, it is certainly their top request and something that, uh, that I am deeply uh, involved and concerned about and, and hearing from other leaders in the Indo-Pacific that um, uh, they have real concerns about this. So I hope we can work together on it. Uh, let me, too, in, in, in my brief amount of time, I'll just say that 
I, you know, I am concerned about this disastrous Iran nuclear deal also. Um, uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, I, I think it is a deeply flawed agreement and, um, and, and certainly a windfall for the world's top supporter of state-sponsored terrorism. So um, I, I hope that uh, I can submit some of these questions, especially vis-a-vis -vis Iranian oil um, uh, today and, and some of the sanctions that are, are, are not being enforced uh, for uh, for the record and see if I can get some uh, response from uh, you and your team. I'd, I'd be grateful. Certainly. The chair, representative, I, the chair recognizes Representative Deutsch of Florida. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, nice to see you. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your, uh, you and the administration's leadership, especially uh, on um, standing up to Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine. Um, it, it's that unjust and illegal invasion that has dramatically shifted the international landscape with uh, our allies and partners around the world. We have coalesced in opposition to Russia's aggression in support of the people of Ukraine. We've implemented unprecedented sanctions packages against Russia, increased the supply of weapons to the courageous and resilient fighters in Ukraine. And while many were surprised Putin went ahead with the invasion, we shouldn't have been. His desire to force Ukraine under Russian control spread counterfactual narratives and delegitimize Ukrainian history and culture is longstanding. His consistent and public declaration of this desire resulted now, has now resulted in another land war in Europe with a uh, nuclear power in Russia attempting to impose its will against the people of Ukraine in response to their desire for democracy, rule of law, alignment with the West. Unfortunately, Mr. Secretary, I, I feel that we're witnessing a similar pattern with Iran, and I want to explain. Iran is the largest state sponsor of terrorism, regularly calls for the destruction of Israel, launched attacks against U.S. military forces and U.S. partners in the region from Saudi Arabia to the UAE. It also takes Americans and other foreign nationals hostage, like my constituent Bob Levinson, uh, as well as Imad Sharji and the Namazis and others. Iran and the IRGC support terror groups in Syria and Lebanon and Gaza and Iraq and Yemen, just to name a few. The regime has made its intentions to destabilize the region and expand its empire clear since the Islamic Revolution of 1979. Its nuclear program now uh, enriches to 60 percent, which, as the uh, IAEA Director General has said, is done only by countries who are developing or intend to develop nuclear weapons. Now, it sometimes seems that our policy towards Iran, and we've seen this here in this committee even today, that our policy towards Iran is entirely the JCPOA. The conversations we've had here have focused on the JCPOA and whether or not to re-enter the nuclear deal. But that's not obviously a policy to address everything that Iran represents. And just as we have led our European allies in confronting Russia, we should lead our partners in the region, Israel, the Abraham Accords nations, our other partners in confronting Iran to address all of Iran's actions. So my first question to you, Mr. Secretary, is can you, can you tell us, and by the way, one last thing on this, whether there is a, a JCPOA or not, whether there is a deal that's struck or not, everything that I described will continue. So let's start by asking if you could just define what our policy is with respect to Iran, the country whose mullahs have taken all of these actions consistently now for decades. Yeah. Uh, you're exactly right. Uh, whether or not there is a, a, a JCPOA, uh, all of the actions and activities that you've described uh, will uh, continue. Now, one fundamental question for us is, uh, an Iran with a nuclear weapon or the capacity to get one on short order is likely to act with even greater impunity in doing all of these things, which is one of the reasons we want to do everything we can to deny it the cap capability to have a weapon. But having said that, uh, your, your point is a very important one, which is why, irrespective of an agreement or not, we are working with allies and partners, with uh, our Arab partners, with Israel and others, to make sure that we are putting in place uh, the means necessary to deal with all of these other challenges, hardening defenses, um, long-range bomber overflights, um, deepening cooperation to interdict, uh, sanctioning uh, relevant uh, Iranian actors, uh, boosting the capacity of our partners. Uh, again, all of these things uh, 
to confront, can contend with everything you've just described, irrespective of whether there's a nuclear agreement. And, and it is our position still, as you referred to earlier, imagine Iran with a nuclear weapon, that JCPOA or no, it is our policy that Iran will not acquire a nuclear weapon. That is correct. And we heard multiple times in, in, uh, during the negotiation of the original JCPOA that all options were that all options remained on the table. I want to reconfirm that that continues to be true that, today. That is correct. Um, I appreciate it, Mr. Secretary. As we go forward, uh, instead of talking about Plan B, uh, if there is no JCPOA, I, I would just respectfully suggest that Plan A always be and continue to be exactly what you described just now. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Thank you. I now recognize Representative Brian Mast of Florida for five Thank minutes. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Secretary. Uh, over here, <laughs> robust sanctions on, uh, on Russia. You called them massive consequences. I uh, want to speak a little bit about those. At minimum, would there have to be an agreed upon ceasefire to lift for the United States of America to lift any of those sanctions? Uh, Congressman, we're not, uh, we're certainly not talking about lifting sanctions. We're talking about uh, Would there have to be a ceasefire for America to lift our sanctions? Uh, well, at, at a minimum, any movement on any sanctions uh, ceasefire I would, imagine, at would, minimum. Would, would, would need to require something like that. Yeah. Would they have to remove forces from Ukraine to lift any sanctions? Again, all of this, uh, first and most important thing is we will support whatever it is the democratically elected government of Ukraine. These are our sanctions. America's sanctions, sanctions, but they're in commerce, service. America's commerce with Russia, America's determination on who we are going to get energy from, everything else, uh, decisions that affect Americans. So for America and our sanctions and our commerce resuming, hmm. does Russia have to be out of the Ukraine? Congressman, the Ukrainians uh, that we are supporting uh, in every uh, way that we can, uh, it's vital that they determine uh, the actions that would be most effective. So you're saying in, Ukraine so will determine no, how I'm the saying United we want, States we want, of America we want to hear from them. their sanctions. Uh, we want to hear from them and allies and partners on what would be most effective and when. So We want to hear from them. They want to hear from us. Mm -hmm. We're the United States of America. Zelensky came to the United mm -hmm. States of America, said we're the leader of freedom. We have to be the leader of peace. He addressed the House of Representatives, the Senate. So let's be America and lead. And as the Secretary of State, what great honor. Do they have to have a ceasefire? Do they have to be out of Ukraine in order for United States of America to regain commerce, any type of commerce, or lift sanctions? Again, what I'm, what I'm not going to do is uh, lay out or engage or negotiate in public on something that we will work in close coordination with the Ukrainians. I think what you mean is you partners. won't answer clearly to the American people. This is our country. These are our sanctions. This is what we're doing. We are providing arms. We are doing cyber warfare. We are doing economic warfare. We are in a situation on the global stage where nobody can say there's zero percent chance of nuclear war. That's, that's a tough we're situation to be in. We're doing all of this. So answer uh, to the Americans. No, we're doing all of this uh, in service of ensuring that Ukraine remains sovereign, remains independent, uh, and we, will, we are looking at what actions would be uh, required to make sure that we can keep doing that, as we're well as making stuff sure. We're doing for Americans, too. As well we're as making sure. We're doing it for sure. Ukrainians. We're doing it for Americans as well. Uh, there's a lot that's going on that's hurting Americans. What's going on with energy, very specifically, that's an easy one to talk about. But let's go back to these. Does there have to be a war tribe, a war crime tribunal for Putin before we will lift any sanctions or allow for any commerce? There has to be accountability, and there will be accountability. War crime uh, But again, tribunal? I'm, not go I'm not going to get into uh, spelling out a roadmap of when or if sanctions would be lifted. We will determine that. That's in, sad that we won't lay out a roadmap for what a, has to happen. That's very weak not, negotiation. Not negotiate in, from strength, not, not from weakness. Not, uh, not, in, not, not in public, not, not at this time. Will they have to repay damages for everything that they've destroyed in their Ukraine? Uh, we want to make sure that not only is there accountability for war crimes that have been committed, but there's accountability for the fact will that they've there be committed reparations, active destruction. So reparations we will look, for everybody that's We will look killed. at making sure that uh, the damage that was done to Ukraine is assumed by those who committed it. I hope that these are bare minimum things mm. that take place 
before the United States of America consider resuming any commerce with Russia, Putin whatsoever, before we consider lifting any sanctions whatsoever, and that we begin starting to speak to them from these positions of strength. I want to yield a couple of moments to my colleague, Mr. Zeldin, to address some of the lies that you told us earlier. Uh, thank you. In, in response to uh, Mr. Connolly, you said that prior to the U.S. withdrawal that uh, Iran did not violate the letter of the JCPOA. Is that your position? That prior, I'm sorry, can you Prior to the U.S. withdrawal from the yes. JCPOA that Iran did not vi violate the letter of the JCPOA. Is that your position? At various points, we had concerns that they were in violation. We brought that to the dispute resolution mechanism that was built into the agreement, and okay. those concerns were resolved. So twice, IAEA found Iran in violation of heavy water. They found that they had assembled more IR-6s, that they had acquired more IR-8 rotor assemblies, that they attempted to acquire carbon fiber that they're not allowed to all in violation of the letter of the JCPOA. Now, you all know this, but you come here anyway and you gaslight us. So we're forced to call you out on it. Next time you come here, please don't make believe like they haven't violated the letter of the JCPOA before Gentlemen's we Gentlemen's time has expired, and let me remind all members, um, tough questioning, challenging questioning is perfectly appropriate, but uh, accusing the Secretary of State of lying is, in, in my view, a violation of the decorum that we have on a bipartisan basis, Don't try lie, to maintain this We won't make the committee. accusation. That's simple. I will now uh, yield to Representative Brad Sherman of California for five minutes. There's some that will hold you to an impossible standard, that somehow the administration has failed if we don't get absolutely total justice in Ukraine, and uh, Iran doesn't change its regime and everything. Uh, we live in a real world, uh, and uh, uh, it is not a failure of the administration that the world will be imperfect even when you leave it, uh, leave the administration. Uh, I want to commend you, Mr. Secretary, for talking about how important it is that we have an international vaccination program. Not only is that moral, but every infection leads to replication. Every replication is an opportunity for mutation. And uh, if you're on Team Human, We've got to immunize every human on the planet or another uh, 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 variant is coming back to the United States. In Pakistan, you see the uh, most uh, uh, internally contentious and unpredictable politics of any nuclear power. And Congress has directed uh, the voice of America to reach out to the people of uh, uh, Pakistan in the Sindhi language as well as Urdu. Uh, the VOA has ignored that. We even gave the money for it. They ignored that. I hope that they hear from you how important it is that we reach the people of Pakistan mm -hmm. and in southern Pakistan in the Sindhi mm -hmm. language. In Syria, um, we still have a huge humanitarian problem. Uh, it's important that our humanitarian aid not go through Assad. Uh, and as we have it in our interest to weaken Russia, we might want to take a look at those who are uh, standing up to Assad, to Tehran, and to Russia uh, in Syria. Uh, some of us have been urging lethal weapons go to Ukraine for many, many years. We faced a lot of headwinds from the last administration. Thank you for what you're doing. Um, the world focused us on uh, Ukraine, but 500,000 people have died in Tigray. Uh, I commend you for your visit to Ukraine. I hope that we pay if not equal, at least more attention to Tigray. The Ethiopian and Eritrean governments are using uh, starvation as a weapon. Um, and the World Food Program says that 90% of the people there need assistance. Your deputy secretary came to us very late last year and said uh, uh, that a decision had been made to refrain from making a, a public determination on atrocities and to whether this is genocide. Uh, do you want to, I mean, you got to call them as you see them. Can I count on the State Department for making a public determination? Are there gross human rights abuses and is there genocide in Tigray? Uh, thank you, Congressman, very much. Uh, first, um, there, are, there have clearly been atrocities committed by every party in Ethiopia. There's no doubt about that. Uh, in terms of an actual legal determination uh, of uh, what they are in their nature, we will make that determination. Thank you. Um, 
We have uh, provided substantial defense assistance to Israel. 43,000 rockets have been launched by Hamas and Islamic Jihad. Thank God the casualties have been modest, and that is because of Iron Dome. But keep in mind, that was 4,300 attempts to kill as many Israeli civilians as possible. Every one of those rockets was a war crime. Not a single one had any uh, uh, real prospect of hitting a strategic target. Um, as you know, the Obama-Biden administration agreed uh, to a comprehensive memorandum of understanding on our level, uh, our minimum level of aid. Uh, you and President Biden have indicated uh, opposition to imposing new political conditions or restrictions on this assistance. Do you continue to oppose new political restrictions on our defense assistance to Israel? We do. Good. And uh, turning to the caucuses, um, uh, should, should the administration not waive Section 907, at least until the POWs are released and uh, those of Armenian ethnicity are able to go back to their homes from which they've been cleansed? First, we're working um, very assiduously on uh, any POWs. This is something that I've engaged the most senior leadership in Azerbaijan on. Second, 907 is as it is annually uh, under review, and as soon as we have the results of that review, obviously we'll make those known to you. Hopefully you will not wave it. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, I now yield five minutes to Representative Fitzpatrick of Pennsylvania. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. Uh, before I get to Ukraine, and if this question has already been posed, I apologize, but uh, CNN reported yesterday um, that over $7 billion um, in military equipment was left behind in Afghanistan to include mm -hmm. aircraft, which is literally twice the amount of defensive equipment that we just authorized for Ukraine a few weeks back. Mm -hmm. I just want to give you an opportunity to comment on that. Uh, I haven't seen that specific report, but uh, you're correct. Over 20 years, uh, a huge amount of military equipment was provided to the Afghan security forces, <coughs> which unfortunately, as we know, collapsed uh, in, in extremis. And uh, much of that equipment, uh, 20 years later, uh, remained, and in turn, much of that equipment was taken by the, the Taliban. So I don't know about the specific report, but that certainly sounds uh, sounds possible. If you could take that for the record and, and get a response to yes, it. Yes, I will. That would be great. Uh, back to, uh, to Ukraine. Um, th there's two different paradigms that I hear from all sorts of people, um, whether this is Ukraine's fight between them and Russia hmm. versus is this the world's fight? Is this democracy versus dictatorship? Mm. What's, what's your view on this? It's both. Um, it's uh, first in, in the first instance, of course, Ukraine's fight because they are under <coughs> horrific assault by Russia. We're standing with them on that. But you're also correct that I believe this should be uh, the world's fight. And indeed, we've worked uh, to make it that because, as we were discussing a little bit earlier, the aggression that Russia is committing is not only against uh, Ukraine. It's against some of the basic principles of the international order that should be uh, important to countries around the world, because if those principles are violated with impunity and we let that go, then uh, we open a Pandora's box for more of this to happen in other parts of the world. So it's both. Is there any Rubicon uh, that would be crossed, any red line, uh, that can or will be determined, which will change this NATO, non-NATO distinction? Because mm -hmm. a lot of people are having a hard time reconciling um, how we could assist on the periphery through sanctions, through defensive military equipment, but never going in, um, and s watch tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians get slaughtered. Mm. And yet if one step is taken over the Romanian border and one Romanian is killed, that the full force of 30 nations' militaries would come to bear. Mm. Is your Romanian life worth that much more than Ukrainian life? Why are we, all life is equal, and we should care about all life. Um, why the cliff effect of this NATO, non-NATO distinction? Because yes, the NATO addresses the legal obligations we have under Article 5, but there's a second prong to this analysis. What's our moral obligation? It's, it's a good question and an important question. And as you note, we have uh, an alliance with obligations and commitments uh, with the NATO countries that includes Article 5. Uh, that does not hold for uh, Ukraine and uh, a number of other countries in Europe. And for that matter, it doesn't hold for other countries around the world. Um, we uh, are doing, <clears throat> through the security assistance we're providing, the economic support we're giving, uh, the humanitarian aid uh, we're making available, uh, we are uh, going to extraordinary lengths to help the Ukrainian people deal with this aggression, deal with it effectively, and they have been. 
There's no doubt that, her you're right, horrific uh, death, destruction has happened and continues in southern eastern Ukraine, which is exactly why uh, we are uh, doubling down on everything that we can do to make sure that they have the means in their own hands uh, to deal with this aggression. There are, of course, many places around the world. Uh, and uh, Congressman Sherman just referred, for example, to, uh, to Ethiopia, where we're seeing uh, <clears throat> horrific things happening. Uh, I could point to 20 or 30 different places. And the question for us in each instance is, what uh, can we do? And what are we responsible for doing uh, to try to deal with uh, the situation? There's not a one-size-fits-all uh, approach to this. And with regard to Ukraine, I think it's, uh, it's fair to say that we've taken uh, exceptional steps uh, in advance of and now during this aggression to help the Ukrainians defeat it. Surely you acknowledge this is a very unique situation. Three quarters of Ukrainian children have been displaced, mm -hmm. having bombs dropped on their head, pediatric cancer hospitals being bombed, maternity wards being mm -hmm. bombed, war crimes unlike we've ever seen in our lifetime. So yes, genocide occurs everywhere and it's wrong everywhere and we should help everywhere we can. This is a very unique circumstance and I think it's important that the Ukrainians know that. Mm -hmm. um, and what, what I think is puzzling and concerning to so many of us in this body is this administration's seeming propensity to tell people what they're not going to do, uh, signal to Vladimir Putin what we're not willing to do, taking options off the table. Even if that decision has been made internally, why telegraph that? It's also important to be clear uh, about uh, a few things. And first, I would say uh, I think we've been extremely clear not only in what we've said, but in what we've actually done to make sure that the Ukrainians have in their hands the means to deal with uh, and uh, ultimately defeat this Russian aggression. And when I saw President Zelensky a few days ago with, um, with Secretary Austin, um, he expressed directly to me uh, his deep appreciation for the support this Congress has given to Ukraine and for President Biden's leadership. And he said the United States was its number one supporter uh, around the world. And uh, he said that he said something akin to that publicly uh, after the meeting. But again, I don't want to put words in, in his mouth. Um, so uh, it's very clear uh, not uh, what we're not doing, but what we are doing. And I think that's manifesting itself uh, in Ukraine on the battlefield. My time's expired. You're back. Thank you. Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative Bill Keating of Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary, thank you for your extraordinary work and uh, thank you for the work you've done uh, in bringing home uh, Trevor Reed. Uh, I've spoken with the Reed family. Uh, I know and have followed that uh, very closely, um, and, and I know the extraordinary effort that went into that. I also want to thank you for the effort that you're giving with uh, trying to bring home uh, Paul Whelan, who has been uh, illegally uh, imprisoned for over 1,200 days uh, and will pledge to do anything I could do, or, and I'm not alone in Congress saying that, uh, to try and bring him home uh, as soon as possible. Uh, I was recently, and the other thing I want to thank you for, uh, not from the perspective, not only from the perspective as a member of Congress here in the U.S., but uh, I don't think it's fully appreciated the, just the extraordinary work at putting together the transit and holding together and moving forward the transatlantic coalition that we have in place. Uh, we would not be talking uh, about a Ukraine uh, victory. We would not be even talking about uh, what we could do as a country if we acted alone. Uh, we know that we can't do it alone. But I just want to share with you the perspective which I have regularly with foreign leaders, European leaders in particular. Those are their comments. Those are their thoughts. And, and it's terrific to have them talk about a U.S. government and, and an effort uh, from state, from defense, from so many different areas of our government uh, that are stepping up. At, at a time of crisis the world has never seen. Uh, one of the people I spoke with recently, uh, I spoke to the ambassador from Poland, but also uh, the mayor from Warsaw recently mm -hmm. too. Uh, what they're doing there is nothing short of astounding either. They are just the absorption of school children. In just in several weeks, uh, 20,000 children are now in school in Warsaw alone. Over 180,000 students from Ukraine mm -hmm. are now in school in Poland right now. These are just extraordinary achievements. Uh, they are strained, and I know in the supplemental budgets we have uh, given some funds, but with the pr plans for the long-term funding that we released today, will there be uh, areas of assistance we can continue to give countries like Poland that are just doing these uh, almost 
uh, Herculean uh, things to try and at a time of great humanitarian need. Yeah. I appreciate you, you, you pointing that. Let me just say, first of all, uh, when it comes to uh, Paul Whelan, uh, I am determined that uh, we bring him home as well. Uh, we are not letting up in that effort in the, in the least. Um, second, with regard to, to Poland and other countries, we've seen extraordinary generosity by the Polish people, Moldovans we talked about earlier, uh, others in taking in Ukrainian refugees, supporting them. Europe as a whole um, has uh, done something remarkable in making sure that uh, Ukrainians who wind up as refugees in Europe uh, can be there for, for two years and, and get support uh, that they need. But this is obviously uh, placing a burden on other countries. So we have been ourselves working to provide uh, appropriate assistance, including to alleviate some of the burden that these countries are facing to help them provide humanitarian support uh, to Ukrainians uh, who need it, and that includes Poland. That's great. The, uh, the other thing, we had a, a subcommittee hearing this morning uh, uh, dealing with uh, Northern Ireland, uh, the Good Friday Agreement and uh, the fragile nature uh, of mm -hmm. circumstances there. Um, you know, we had some extraordinary young people uh, that testified, uh, and uh, there's great hope that change will occur through that generation as well. Uh, I spoke uh, after that uh, with the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, uh, Simon Coveney, uh, and we were discussing uh, a letter I uh, led, a bipartisan letter uh, to the State Department to, calling for a special envoy uh, for Northern Ireland so that we can become more involved. Uh, there, I'm very concerned yeah. with so many other things in the, going on in the world, but there remains a real crisis brewing there. And the elections are coming uh, just in the next few days in Northern Ireland, and we don't know the ramifications of what that might be. But could you give me uh, an update on any progress with a special envoy? Uh, in short, I anticipate that we'll be moving forward uh, soon on naming an envoy. Great. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and I'd, I'd just like to briefly note that uh, we have a delegation of parliamentarians from Ukraine who just joined us. Um, you can wave there, and of course, thank you. It is, it is our great hope that you will soon be able to meet as we do here without any fear of of violence being done to your beautiful capital and that your democracy will long endure. And with that, let me call on Representative Buck of Colorado for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here. You. Uh, a little different concern, want to move away from Ukraine for just a moment if we can. I am uh, concerned about uh, the fentanyl that is coming to mm -hmm. this country that is largely manufactured in, in China. Yeah. Um, just a, a few statistics. Uh, fiscal year 2021, uh, Border Patrol seized 11,201 pounds of fentanyl at the southern border, um, which was more than double what they seized in fiscal year 2020 and five times what they seized in fiscal year 2019. Uh, to put that in perspective, uh, uh, the amount seized by, the amount of fentanyl seized by Border Patrol in 2021 is enough to kill the entire U.S. population more than seven times over. Uh, the leading cause of death in America uh, of adults between the ages of 18 and 45 is fentanyl overdose. Uh, recently in Colorado, in Colorado Springs, we had uh, three high school students die uh, of fentanyl overdose, one actually collapsing in class uh, from, from that use. It is, it is terrible. I'm wondering if you have had conversations with Chinese leadership about the production and, and, uh, of fentanyl and, and what those conversations, uh, whether they are productive or not. Uh, in short, yes to the conversations. Uh, productive remains, remains to be seen. First of all, can I just applaud your leadership on trying to deal with the opioid uh, crisis that we have in this country? Uh, and I very much share your concerns about this, and in particular share the concerns about fentanyl that is originating uh, in China and is making its way into the United States, including through Mexico. So two things. We've been wor working on this in three ways. The President has raised this directly with President Xi Jinping uh, of China. Uh, second, we've gotten some of the uh, fentanyl precursors uh, that were not on prohibited lists added uh, to those uh, lists so that we were able to uh, get others to police this more effectively. 
third, um, we're working with the Mexican government uh, on seeing uh, about it having uh, the technology necessary to better detect efforts to smuggle uh, fentanyl or precursors into uh, the United States. We're working across all of those lines of effort. But to your point, uh, it's very important that the Chinese government take action to do something effective about this, and it's something that we're on. Um, my understanding, uh, Mr. Secretary, is there is not much of a fentanyl problem in China. I believe that's correct. Uh, and the Chinese government, I, I think we would all agree, is an authoritarian regime and knows just about everything its citizens are doing. And if fentanyl is coming into this country from China, they probably know about it. And, and I don't want to uh, propose a conspiracy theory, uh, but I do ask whether you believe that this is a long-term strategy by an adversary to undermine this country and, and the, uh, the youth in this country. Drugs tear at the fabric of our country, uh, particularly younger uh, people. And uh, it would not surprise me if an adversary like China had a strategy to introduce drugs into this country knowing that it would sap our strength. I don't want to speculate about uh, any strategies or not. All I can focus on is uh, what's actually happening and what could be done about it. And there's no doubt in my mind that the Chinese government could act much more effectively in uh, working to prevent the fentanyl from leaving uh, China and getting eventually into the United States. And why wouldn't they? Good question. I'm asking. No, I don't. I, again, nothing that I can that I can speculate on. There may be. Um, economic motivations. There may be other motivations. They may uh, claim that they, this is something that uh, they uh, can't deal with as effectively as we believe they can. Um, all of those things are possible. But uh, the bottom line is, like you, uh, we want to see results and we want to see uh, concrete actions taken that result in fentanyl or precursors um, no, no, getting country, into the country. A country like Colombia. Uh, will allow American DEA agents mm -hmm. and others in uh, mm -hmm. to you know, allow our military to help train. Mm -hmm. I know I've been to Guatemala. I have seen our, our military, our mm -hmm. Navy SEALs working with their Marines. Uh, I am uh, assuming that China isn't quite as open to our military being in their country. <laughs> I think that's a fair statement. Um, and again, it, it just raises the issue of why not. I appreciate your efforts on, on this and anything we can do in Congress Thank to you. help, uh, we would greatly like to do that. Thank you. Will I the yield. gentleman yield? Will the gentleman yield? Yes, I will. I, I just, Mr. Chairman, thanks. Um, I just want to, uh, I just want to take a moment to um, both uh, thank the gentleman from Colorado and, uh, and thank the Secretary of State. Um, this is, um, this is, Ms. Buck is right, this is a, a crisis that affects every community in our country. And, and in the case of my nephew, who died of accidental fentanyl ingestion, this is not, this is not a question of overdose. This is a question of actions taken, whether by the government, whether by drug dealers, the government in China, whether by drug dealers or others, um, to murder our kids. I'm grateful to you and to you. I yield back. Thank you both. Um, I um, yield five minutes to Representative Cicilline of Rhode Island. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. And I want to really begin by thanking you and the President for the enormous amount of work that I know it took to both build and keep strong an international coalition, uh, not only NATO, but our European partners to respond to uh, Vladimir Putin's aggression in Ukraine. And it wasn't that long ago, sadly, that we had a president of the United States advocating uh, for the ab ab abolition of NATO, or at least undermining it in very significant ways. And so I think we take for granted for sometimes what it took uh, for President Biden and you to both build and keep intact this extraordinary coalition that's absolutely essential for the Ukrainians to win this fight. So I want to begin by saying thank you uh, for that and for all the work that you're doing to restore American leadership around the world on so many important issues. Uh, I think it's also important to remember that Secretary Kerry told us at the time we originally considered the JCPOA that the mission was to keep Iran from becoming a nuclear power, which remains the commitment of this administration, because then we can, in fact, push back in a variety of different ways. It's much more difficult to do that 
when someone has nuclear weapons, and we're learning that as we think about responding to Russia's aggression. So I hope everyone remembers that lesson. Um, I want to ask you specifically uh, as it relates to um, Ukraine and the impact it's having on food insecurity globally. We just returned uh, from a visit with the uh, head of the World Food Program, uh, Ms. Governor Beasley, and, and with uh, Ambassador McCain, who runs, as you know, the UN mission. And, you know, the, the disruption of the supply chain is obviously a piece of it, but we also learned about the efforts that, that the Chinese are engaged in to kind of increase their efforts in responding to the food insecurity around the world. And so how is the State Department coordinating our food security efforts, the food security efforts of our allies, um, to help counter, to be, be, be effective in responding to this crisis, but also to think about it as a way to uh, counter the malign influence of China and others. And in particular, we learned about the failure of Gulf countries to play a meaningful role in responding to the um, uh, food insecurity. I wonder kind of what's the status of those discussions. Uh, I, I very, very much appreciate you putting a spotlight on that and the work that you're doing on that, including with, uh, uh, with David Beasley, with Ambassador McCain. Um, this is vitally important because one of the horrific consequences of the Russian aggression against Ukraine is an accentuation of what was already uh, a significant food security challenge uh, around the world. And we probably have an additional 40 million people as a result of the aggression and the inability because of Russia of the Ukrainians to export effectively uh, the wheat that they're producing, um, blockades of the Black Sea ports, uh, literally attacking uh, farms and farmers. Um, this has, uh, of course, contributed to uh, uh, difficulty in countries getting wheat that they had contracted for. There's, some, there, there's actually a, a huge amount that's been produced this year, but it can't get out of the country because of uh, the Russian blockade, among other things. So um, we're seeing the effects literally around the world, as you know, and we're operating on a number of uh, lines of effort to address this directly. First, let me just say that next month we're going to chair the uh, Security Council of the United Nations. Uh, I'm putting the focus of our month-long presidency on food security uh, and taking concrete steps to, to address it. Uh, we have a, uh, a plan before Congress um, for um, de dealing with feeding the future um, that includes $11 billion over five years to address this both in the immediate but also long term. We are pressing countries uh, to make contributions to uh, the World Food Program to the uh, uh, Food and Agriculture Organization, which are underfunded given the needs that they have now. We're urging countries that have stockpiles of food to release those stockpiles uh, and also not to put in place export controls that restrict their ability to get food to where it's needed. Um, we are, uh, the President has incentivized our own producers of uh, fertilizer to produce more uh, and get, uh, get more out. Uh, we've uh, done emergency assistance to a number of countries that most acutely need it for food security. Uh, Ethiopia, uh, Kenya, Somalia, uh, about $100 million over the last few weeks. So across all of these lines, we're trying to address the problem in the immediate, but also longer-term sustainability. Great. Thank you. And, and we look forward to being sure we're doing our part in supporting those efforts in any way that we can. My final question, Mr. Secretary, is uh, I, there is a letter that I led with 150 colleagues uh, requesting an increase in funds which support LGBTQI rights around the world um, through the global a fund uh, and the European Democracy Resilience Initiative. As you know, LGBTQI people around the world are facing really unprecedented violence and repression. And I just hope that you will commit to streamlining democracy and human rights funding to include uh, you know, gender equity and empowerment and an inclusive LGBTQI people and support increased funding for, for this community, for our community, uh, which is really in uh, Tremendous need. We, we do, and I welcome working with you on that. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Chairman's time has expired. I now recognize Representative Mark Green of Tennessee, who's the ranking member of the Subcommittee on the Western Hemisphere, Civilian Security, Migration, and International Economic Policy for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, ranking member. And I want to let the uh, Secretary know that the nearshoring bill that your team reviewed has finally been dropped. Uh, so thank you for the input from uh, uh, Secretary Zaniga and the others, Deputy Secretary Zaniga, who, who helped with that. Um, also, thanks for being here today. I want to thank you, too, for I think I understood correctly we're going to send some State Department people back in uh, to, to Ukraine. I think that's a good decision. I thought taking everyone out was a bad decision. I'll be completely honest with you. I, I remember uh, from my study of history, the State Department stayed all through the bombing of London in World War II. 
yet we, we kind of ran away on this one. We shouldn't have, and I'm glad to hear that you're moving folks back in. I want to jump uh, back a few months to Afghanistan. You know where I am on this, and you know my criticisms of both your department and DOD and the administration. What I want to ask today is how many American citizens are still in Afghanistan? So uh, let me say two things on that. First of all, I appreciate uh, the uh, other points that you mentioned. Um, there are at present uh, 126, as of a few days ago, uh, American citizens remaining, of whom 37 uh, seek to, to leave and that we are assisting. Since uh, we left Afghanistan uh, on August 31st, we've directly assisted the departure of, uh, again, as of a few days ago, 636 American citizens uh, and uh, many uh, LPRs as well. The 37, there's, there, but y'all are working a plan to get the 37 back. That's out. correct. Okay, very good. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I assume, and I think it was talked about a little earlier, you're familiar with the company Rosatum or Rosatum? Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. So um, it looks like they're a state-owned enterprise for Russia, and it looks also that they will be the ones that build the $10 billion reactor for Iran. Is that correct? Um, uh, under the, the, the Bushir plan, yes, yes I Bushir. believe that's, that's correct. Um, and my, my question to you is, um, how much sense does it make when we have these sanctions on, Iran, or on Russia to allow a state-owned enterprise of Russia to build a $10 billion nuclear reactor in, in Iran? So the trade-off is this. Uh, the uh, reactor that uh, they and others would take part in building uh, would be a proliferation-resistant reactor, which means that whatever is produced by it or through it could not be uh, effectively used uh, to uh, build a, uh, a nuclear weapon or produce fissile material for a weapon, and that's a very important security concern for the United States. I can, think. Uh, can anybody else build that reactor? Well, uh, I mean, why give the profits to this to the very guys we're trying to keep from funding a war in Ukraine? Mm. Question is, if there's an effective alternative, we can certainly uh, look at that. But yeah, it's not clear I, I'd ask you to do that, uh, and I think most Americans, if they were to apply just some common logic to this, if we're doing sanctions here to keep the we stopped buying their oil so that they wouldn't continue to fund the assault on Ukraine, then why would we give them you know, $10 billion or allow them to get $10 billion to build a nuclear reactor? So uh, what I'm hearing you say is that you guys are looking for an alternative. Is that correct? If there's an, if there's an effective alternative. Now, uh, of course, it would require Iran to accept that alternative. So that's, an, that's, uh, that's part of the equation as well. Okay. Mr. Secretary, the, the families of American hostages in Venezuela, uh, such as the Marine and Tennessee and Matthew Heath, were told that exchanges were off the table. Uh, yet the administration did make an exchange for Trevor Reed. I'm glad to see Trevor Reed home. I was on the phone with uh, Mr. Fluger late into the night, making sure that he could see his family on the tarmac. Uh, can you explain the discrepancy between those two? Uh, Congressman, around the world, wherever there is an American uh, arbitrarily detained, including in, in Venezuela, uh, we're looking at everything possible we can do uh, to bring them home. Each situation uh, is different, as you know, recently. Uh, I do. We, we sent a, uh, a delegation to Venezuela for the purpose of trying to get uh, our Americans back home, and we were able to get two of them back. Uh, I, I but, uh, as you know, half a dozen remain. We were working on that uh, every single day. Well, I, I appreciate the efforts there. As I understood it, too, though, that trip was designed to, to find uh, a solution for the $500 billion of oil we were buying from Russia uh, as an alternative, potentially using Venezuela. So uh, it was more than just to to negotiate those guys. I mean, I, but I appreciate the fact, and I think you got two of them home. We, we got two of them trip. home, so, six, but six, six remain. Six remain, and, and I appreciate it. Very quickly, and I'd, I'm going to ask this to be sent to me because uh, I'm going to run out of time here very quickly. Leadership in Guatemala have, have told me that your, your department is putting pressure on them to pick a certain candidate for an attorney general. And I'd like for someone to send a letter to me or, or in, you know, offline a call Mm -hmm. I want to find out why we're putting pressure on a, another country to pick a certain attorney general and what criteria you're using or what, what's justifying that bullying, what I believe is bullying. I, I'm but, happy to follow up. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. I now recognize Representative Ted Liu of California for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Meeks, for holding this hearing, and uh, thank you, Secretary of State Blinken, for your distinguished public service. I want to first thank you for the action you took on assignment restrictions announcing that you would lift over half of them. I think that's a great first step, so thank you uh, for doing that. I'd like to now uh, turn to Ukraine. And the U.S. hasn't just been helping Ukraine this year. In fact, we've been helping them pretty simply since 2014. Isn't that correct? That is correct. 
and from 2014 until January 20th of last year, we provided um, a little over a billion dollars in funding. Is that correct? That's correct. But then under the Biden administration, we significantly ramped up the military aid to Ukraine. And my understanding is that we provided up to now over $4.6 billion to the that, that is correct. Ukraine. Without that military assistance, Russia would have rolled in and taken over Kiev, because that is correct. how the world viewed it. I just want to emphasize what an amazing accomplishment that is, that Ukraine will remain a free, sovereign, independent nation. That was not something that people thought was going to happen. It would not have happened, but for the involvement of you and others and the President of the United States and NATO countries. So I just want to make sure that we emphasize that. We're now in a second phase of the war, which is how do we help Ukraine push back against Russian forces in the south and in the east. That requires a different set, in my opinion, of weapons, more advanced weapons. And you were right in pushing for MiGs to go to Ukraine. And just based on public reporting, it was, uh, I commend you for trying to do that. I believe that air power and air dominance is a critical component of modern warfare. And I continue to urge you to push to do that. I'd like to now turn to state sponsors of terrorism. And under State Department policy, you get to designate countries as state sponsors of terrorism. If a country is so designated, then that gives us certain options. One of them is, for example, it would allow us uh, to uh, ban dual use exports to that country, is that correct? Another is it would allow the U.S. to take economic action against countries that continue to do business with, with mm -hmm. that designated country, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Uh, it could also freeze that country's assets in the U.S., including real estate. Mm -hmm. And it could cause the U.S. to veto efforts of that country to secure, for example, World Bank loans or other loans such as that. Yes. In order for you to designate that, you need two instances, at least, of that country sponsoring terrorism. So when we talk about Russia, uh, it's true, right, that Russia provides sanctuary to a U.S. designated terrorist group known as the Russian Imperial Movement. Uh, let, let me say this, Congressman, I appreciate the, uh, the question and, and, and the issue. We have... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Go, go ahead. We, ha we have the, uh, the Office of our Legal Advisor looking at this question about whether under uh, the law uh, the criteria uh, exist to consider Russia a state sponsor of terrorism in the case of, of Ukraine. That is under uh, review a as we speak. The only other thing I'd add is all of the measures that you rightly point out that we would be able to um, uh, apply on the base of that law, of course, many of them we, we can and are already applying under other uh, types of designations. So um, what's, what's, what, two things are important, I think. Uh, first, of course, is making sure that we are adhering to the law, meeting the law, meeting its requirements. Uh, the second is making sure that we're effective and uh, by whatever tools we have uh, available to us uh, to be effective in doing a number of the things that you pointed to. Thank you. On April 22nd, 10 members of the Foreign Affairs Committee sent you a letter about designating Russia as a state sponsor mm -hmm. of terrorism, and we laid out all the various examples of how Russia, in fact, was a state sponsor mm -hmm. of terrorism. I just want to urge you to look at this standard. So the standard is not whether we have to prove this beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, it's not whether an academic professor somewhere could say, hey, maybe Russia doesn't technically meet these requirements, mm -hmm. and we believe Russia does meet these requirements. I think we have to just apply the common sense standard. Mm -hmm. uh, the American people will not understand if we do not designate Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism. They're watching horrific images on their TV day after day after day. So I just urge you to apply the common sense standard, go through your process, and with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. I now uh, recognize Representative Joe Wilson of South Carolina, who's the ranking member of the Subcommittee on the Middle East, North Africa, and Global Counterterrorism for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Secretary, thank you and Secretary Austin uh, for visiting in Kiev uh, with um, Vladimir Zelensky. Uh, gosh, what an inspiration uh, President Zelensky is to the world uh, as we are in a worldwide conflict and it's authoritarianism by rule of gun with democracy by rule of law. 
and uh, with a worldwide conflict, and uh, your leadership is so important. In fact, uh, this uh, week, sadly, War, Putin, War Colonel Putin is threatening our uh, appreciated allies of Poland and Bulgaria by cutting off energy. What is America doing to help these great allies? Mm. Uh, first of all, thank you for your engagement and leadership on this uh, as well. Um, second, with regard to, to this um, cutoff, um, I'd say a few things. Uh, first, there is an element of Russia shooting itself in the foot by doing this because, of course, the revenues and resources that it would get uh, from the, uh, the sale, uh, it, will, it will be denied. Second, we have seen other European countries already jump in to make sure that these countries can get uh, the resources they need to make up for what they might lose from Russia. Third, we have directed um, a significant amount of LNG uh, to Europe over the last few months. We've doubled the amount of American LNG going to Europe since uh, February to comp help compensate for any shortfalls, including those that may result from Russia trying to use this as a tool of blackmail. And I hope, uh, again, LNG will be uh, promoted and, uh, indeed, uh, the uh, floating terminals that can be, yes. be provided, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, deny uh, the war, cr war criminal Putin uh, his ability to con conduct mass murder. Another, uh, in regard to Syria, why uh, isn't the administration applying the mandatory sanctions of the Caesar Act to the Assad regime and its backers? Um, Congressman, I'm happy to work with you on, uh, on that. Uh, we have, uh, we of course are working to use all the authorities uh, that we have. If there are places where you believe we are not uh, effectively using them, I welcome knowing about it. Well, uh, again, the uh, opportunity we have to help the people of Syria uh, overcome the oppression they're facing, whatever could be done. Mm. Uh, another issue to me that I'm concerned about are foreign military sales. Uh, they, uh, it appears to me that they've been handicapped with unnecessary red tape. Uh, what can we do to cut through the red tape uh, to help uh, our, and work with uh, our allies, such as Turkey and India? Uh, I agree with you. I think uh, that we, we can and should do better in, uh, in sales, particularly in uh, the rapidity with which we're able to do things, review things. That's on, I think that's on, the, on us in the executive branch. It's also on Congress. Uh, so I think together we need to look at ways, and we are, in fact, looking at that. Um, you make an important point, too, because a number of countries, as I said earlier, are rethinking their relationships, uh, including with Russia, including countries that have had longstanding defense relationships with Russia. Uh, if we're in a position uh, to um, be a partner to them in ways that maybe we couldn't be some decades ago, um, I think that's something we need to be able to act on. And because, of course, if we don't, uh, we know who's likely to do it in our place. So uh, I agree with you, and it's something we're working on, and welcome working with Congress as well to look at how we can do this um, more efficiently. And uh, in line with that, I'm really grateful that uh, with the leadership of Chairman Greg Meeks, Ranking Member Mike McCall, that we just had a very uh, overwhelming vote to provide Lend-Lease uh, for the people of mm -hmm. Ukraine. Uh, I particularly love the pl uh, irony of this. Uh, in 2005, I had the opportunity to lead an American delegation to show our affection and appreciation of the people of Russia to place a wreath at the cemetery there in St. Petersburg, the half a million people killed uh, in an open grave uh, uh, with the siege of Leningrad. Uh, while I was there, I was so pleasantly surprised to find out that the reason for that success was American aid provided through Lynn Lease. And now we'll be mm. providing Lynn Lease aid, aid, thanks to the chairman, mm. uh, to the people of Kyiv, to the people of Ukraine, mm. uh, to uh, stop an invasion by a war criminal. And so you have the war criminal Hitler, the war criminal uh, Putin, uh, and now we're going to be there uh, as we've provided lend lease for 30 different countries. So how is this going to be expedited? Uh, I very much look forward to looking at that. We have um, a number of important tools uh, and possibly to include what, uh, what you've now put forward. Um, the supplemental that I think is before you as of this morning uh, has a number of very important and um, immediate ways that we can get uh, assistance and sustained assistance to Ukraine, including uh, more resources for foreign military uh, uh, financing, which is vital, uh, replenishing the drawdown account, which has been used so effectively uh, in order to get um, security assistance to, uh, to the Ukrainians. We've done eight drawdowns to date, um, but I'm happy to pursue the, uh, this with you. And ironically, Gentlemen's time has expired. Protected the Putin I, I now recognize Representative Dina Titus of Nevada for five minutes.
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Secretary. Last week, uh, the president announced that Prime Minister Mitsotakis was coming. I know you don't want to step on any of his news <laughs> or get ahead of the president, but I wonder, in kind of reference to your answer to Mr. Wilson's question about other countries stepping up and trying to help countries who've had their oil cut off, Greece has stepped up to said they'd help Bulgaria. Yes. What's the State Department doing with our partners along kind of the southern flank of NATO to assist them or increase trade or work on the pipeline, whatever? Uh, Greece has stepped up, you're right, in, in a big way, uh, not only in assisting uh, the, the countries in question that uh, uh, Congressman Wilson just referenced, but also uh, as well in supporting uh, uh, Ukraine directly. And uh, we deeply uh, appreciate that. I just was uh, with the uh, uh, on the phone with the with the prime minister uh, and others, and uh, that's uh, I think a very important effort that uh, that Greece has really uh, stepped up on. We are uh, working in a variety of ways to support efforts to promote cooperation, regional stability, energy security uh, throughout uh, the Eastern Med. There are a number of uh, projects that 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 are underway or could be underway soon, uh, particularly with regard to energy. Uh, where uh, Greece would be a critical partner. Um, we're looking, uh, among other things, also at some very, I think, compelling projects on uh, electricity interconnectors uh, in the region that would involve, for example, Egypt uh, to Cyprus uh, and Greece, uh, as well as uh, Israel, Cyprus, and Greece. So uh, there are a number of ongoing things uh, where uh, I think we can um, strengthen uh, both the uh, regional security uh, but also strengthen energy security uh, and strengthen partnerships among countries uh, in the region. Well, that's encouraging. I'm glad to hear that, and I'm sure they will be too. Just uh, really shifting gears, I want to ask you about the uh, disability rights, international disability rights. We passed as part of the NDAA guidance for establishing a permanent office within the State Department. And then in the omnibus last year, we had $750,000 set aside for a special advisor. Mm -hmm. I just wonder why the budget doesn't include funding for a uh, special advisor Mankara's team uh, and why the department hadn't moved forward or made the decision to permanently establish this Office of International Disability Rights. I'm happy to come back to you on that uh, to make sure that we do have the resources that we need to carry out this vital uh, mission, but uh, we have a very strong leader uh, for the team. We have uh, the office. I believe that um, the the funding uh, is uh, appropriate uh, and uh, and necessary, but I'm happy to look at uh, whether something else needs to be done to support that mission. Well, thank you. The U.S. has a good reputation with uh, internally, and I think we should lead uh, around the world, and I think having this office with the resources it needs to do that will be uh, commendable and recognized as such by our friends and allies. So thank you, and I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. General Lady yields back. I now recognize Representative Andy Barr of Kentucky for five minutes. Uh, thank you. Uh, welcome back to the committee, Mr. Secretary. Uh, under the previous JCPOA, uh, Russia was allowed to undertake civil nuclear projects in Iran worth billions of dollars. I think Mr. Green was yes, asking you that. about this as well. Uh, now, in the midst of this Russian invasion of Ukraine, Russia is sitting at the negotiating table in Vienna seeking to revive this deal, setting up an escape valve uh, through Tehran to get relief from international sanctions. Um, a revived Iran deal would, would uh, run directly counter to the sanctions that have been imposed. Can you commit, Mr. Secretary, to the Congress that any renegotiated JCPOA would not enable Russia to profit off of Iran? Uh, what I can commit to is that any uh, renewed JCPOA would not in any way um, uh, be in contravention of the sanctions. That no, I understand that. And I understand that, your, your testimony. That's not exactly the, the question I'm asking. Mm -hmm. And I think the fact that you can't answer that question is troubling. I think a, a renegotiated JCPOA uh, needs to address that issue. Uh, we don't want to give a, a, a financial lifeline uh, to, to Russia at this time. Um, uh, sir, in the, in the Russian buildup before the invasion, it was the administration's position that imposing sanctions and arming the Ukrainians before invasion would have been provocative. Uh, this proved to be spectacularly wrong, and we learned that inadequate deterrence uh, invites aggression. Has the administration learned its lesson, and will it accelerate military assistance to Taiwan to enhance deterrence? 
uh, with respect, uh, that's, not, uh, that's not accurate. In fact, before the aggression, well before the aggression, we made sure that the Ukrainians had in their hands uh, the weapons that they needed to deal with it. There was a presidential drawdown of $60 million Labor Day. There was another one of $200 million in December before Christmas. Now, what, to what, your point, let's it was get done, to Taiwan. Uh, to, uh, let's get to the, yep. the point about Taiwan. If, if uh, I'll, 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 I'll st we can have that debate about uh, pre-invasion Ukraine, but, but I do want to emphasize what Ranking Member McCall, what, the point he was making, which is that Taiwan uh, and Twin Oaks has asked us for, for these, uh, these, these uh, foreign military sales to be delivered. We haven't seen uh -huh. delivery. And these are, uh, these are years in the making. Um, some of these orders have come in and approved uh, uh, long previous to now. Mm -hmm. Where are we on actually delivering that to, to establish that deterrence? Yeah. Um, I agree that there's a, uh, a need to further streamline the process of actually getting uh, this uh, equipment uh, in many cases made because there's a, really this goes to supply chain issues, as you know, yeah. uh, as well as delivered. There's been about $18 billion in foreign military uh, financing to um, uh, Taiwan since uh, 2017. That's continued at the same pace, another $2.5 billion in direct commercial sales. But there are supply chain issues uh, that we need to, to work on. Well, we'll love line. to work with you on that. Let's get those resolved. Let's Good. get more uh, uh, lethal military assistance to Taiwan as soon as possible. Um, uh, the, the weakness, in my view, the weakness in the sanctions regime against Russia right now is the general license for energy-related transactions. I recognize that our European allies' over-dependence on Russian energy has been an issue, but I have a bill to close this loophole. I've, I've raised this in the Financial Services Committee with Secretary Yellen, with Wally Adeyemo. They're open to this. Now we see Germany open to the idea of a, of a ban on, on crude oil mm -hmm. imports. So I think our European allies are coming mm -hmm. around. Uh, what is the Department of State's position on closing this this uh, energy loopholes, this general license in our sanctions? Uh, we are working to do everything we can to help the Europeans move off of Russian energy of one kind or another uh, as soon as possible to include oil and uh, ultimately to include gas. I think uh, as we speak, uh, the European Union is looking very closely at this question uh, of oil. I would anticipate that they'll take action on that yeah. in the weeks ahead. Yeah. Gas is a slightly longer-term challenge because, as you know, the reliance is built up over many decades. I understand. Decades. My, my bill would allow for special approval, uh, specific waivers or licenses, mm -hmm. special licenses, but not a general license mm -hmm. on the gas, and escrow that and, mm -hmm. and create a carrot, not just a stick, but mm -hmm. a carrot for Putin to that he would get the proceeds of those sales only when he withdrew. So I want you to take a look at I'm that. I'm happy to do that. We passed the Access Act yesterday. That would uh, require your department to report to Congress on Chinese support for Russia on sanctions evasion. Uh, I ask for your commitment to meet those uh, statutorily mm -hmm. imposed uh, reports uh, if yes. signed into law. Thank you. Finally, um, uh, I represent uh, a nonprofit in my district. For the last 56 years, the International Book Project has shipped nearly 8 million books overseas to schools, libraries, and community organizations in every country in the globe. I'll be submitting a question for the record to inquire how states can increase awareness of the International Book Project to embassies around the world. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Sounds so, like a wonderful project. Yes. Then. Thank Welcome you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. And let me just say at this juncture, because of the hard stop that the Secretary has, we're going to just have one pair of witnesses, one Democrat, one Republican, and then we will be out of time. So I now will recognize Representative Joaquin Castro of Texas, who's the chair of the Subcommittee on International Development and International Organizations uh, and Global Corporate Impact for five minutes. And then the Republican will be Representative Greg Stubbe. Mr. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Castro. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Secretary, for your testimony today. I want to start with a question about Mexico and our relationship with Mexico. The new U.S.-Mexico Bicentennial Framework offers an opportunity to revitalize security cooperation between our two nations with a focus on human rights, public health, and accountability after the failure of the drug war model of the Merida Initiative. In fact, today Mexico is facing record high levels of homicides, increased violence against women and journalists, disappearances, uh, which are worsening because of corruption. Uh, they're being done with impunity, and there seems to be negligence in all aspects, or many aspects at least, of government. Uh, what specific accountability mechanisms is the State Department implementing in the framework to ensure that Mexico's security forces and prosecutors' offices are respecting human rights, investigating corruption, and holding bad actors accountable? So, 
Congressman, thank you for that. Um, we have deepened uh, our cooperation with uh, Mexico across the board, and we want to make sure that our, our cooperation, including uh, in the security uh, sphere, is uh, genuinely comprehensive uh, and, of course, works in, in both directions. And we also have, within the State Department, but also DHS and other actors that are engaged uh, with the Mexican security services, uh, clear accountability measures to make sure that any assistance that's provided is being provided uh, in the appropriate way and is being used in the appropriate way. And if we see that uh, that is not the case, uh, we'll take action uh, to correct it. I'm happy to come back to you uh, in the interest of time with more detail uh, on how and um, uh, how we're doing that, as well as also refer you to uh, some of the other agencies that are involved in supporting uh, and working with Mexico on security. Sure. No, and I appreciate that. And one reason I think that it's particularly important to focus on accountability for security forces that we partner with in Mexico and elsewhere in the Western Hemisphere uh, is the potential for our security assistance to end up feeding illicit arms trafficking if we don't have the appropriate safeguards in place. And in my view, this problem has worsened since the authority to review many exports of small arms was shifted from the State Department to the Commerce Department. Uh, I was glad to see President Biden promise to reverse that change during his campaign. And I just wanted to ask you that as we continue our work, uh, will you work with me to fulfill the president's promise to return oversight of small arms sales to the State Department and pursue other measures to crack down on arms trafficking in the Western Hemisphere? Uh, thank you. And I don't want to get ahead of it, but we should have uh, a, an arms sales um, policy coming out shortly. And um, we've uh, we put, uh, among other things, uh, human rights very much um, front and center in that policy, uh, as well as making sure that we can act efficiently uh, to um, uh, to use these um, uh, to use these authorities. So uh, happy to talk uh, talk to you offline about this, but uh, we should be coming forward with that shortly. Sure, and I'll, I'll truncate my second question, which is on the issue of diversity. Um, uh, I remain concerned by the underrepresentation, for example, of Latino Americans at the State Department, especially at the senior ranks. State's own data showed that only 3.8 of the senior executive service and 6.8 of percent of the senior foreign service identified as Hispanic in September. Uh, I led the effort along with Barbara Lee on the Appropriations mm -hmm. Committee to fund uh, interns at the State yes. Department, which we now, of course, have successfully done and others, of course, helped as well. Uh, but that was meant to build the pipeline so that there are more people who can afford to take on internships at the State Department. So I want to ask you, uh, that's an important piece of helping to diversify. How is the implementation of that program going? Uh, Congressman, first of all, thank you for everything that you've done uh, for a long time uh, leading on this effort. Uh, the paid internship piece is critical, and we are grateful that we now have uh, the uh, authority to do that and, uh, and funds to do that. Uh, we are starting with about 200 paid internships. I hope that we can build that up uh, over the next, uh, the next few years. Uh, it's just uh, getting off the ground, but what I can tell you is this. We've had um, thousands of applications since we've been able to advertise the paid internships. Wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back, and now I yield to Representative Greg Stubbe of Florida for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm not going to belabor the Afghanistan issue, um, but I just want to make clear because I came in as Representative Green was asking you the question. So there's 126 American citizens that are still left in Afghanistan, 37 of which want to return. Is that correct? That's correct. I've made my position on the disastrous withdrawal of the Biden administration and the State Department. We're now over six months. We still have Americans stuck behind enemy lines with the Taliban. I've made my positions clear on that. I want to go and move to the Iran Revolutionary Guard. Could I just mention one thing on that quickly? No, because I only have four and a half minutes, and I'm yielding a minute to Rep. Kim because you're only here till 4.30. Uh, you, you commented before the Senate on your position that the foreign terrorist organization designation on the Iran Revolutionary Guard will not be lifted unless the Iran Revolutionary Guard changed its behavior and ceased support for terrorism. Is that correct? That's correct. Did Iran or the Revolutionary Guard stop their support for terrorism after the JCPOA was reached? Uh, Yes, Iran's uh, support for terrorism has continued uh, so that's a yes. for a long time. No, it has it continued. Did Iran detain 11 U.S. Navy sailors during the period of U.S. participation in the JCPOA? Uh, it did for a brief period of time. Did Iran illegally and unjustly detain Americans during the period of U.S. participation in the JCPOA? It did, and it continues to. 
Did Iran's financial support for Hezbollah, Hamas, and Palestinian Islamic Jihad increase during the period of U.S. participation in the JCPOA? I can't tell you if it increased, but it was certainly sustained. Did Iran's support for the Assad regime increase during the period of U.S. participation in the JCPOA? Uh, I can't tell you if it increased, but it was sustained. It was sustained. Did Iran's support for the Houthis in Yemen increase during the period or remain the same during the period of U.S. participation in the JCPOA? I would say it actually increased over that period. Recently, a group of 900 Gold Star family members and wounded veterans who have been victims of the Revolutionary Guard's terrorist activity sent President Biden a letter asking him not to lift the FTO designation. Are you familiar with that letter? I am familiar with the letter. You, you have a copy of it? I, yes, I've seen it. So what is the administration's response to those families? Again, Iran knows what it would have to do in order to have that designation lifted. I would also say that uh, over this period, including since the designation of the IRGC with the FTO, its attacks on Americans uh, in the region have gone up 400%. So then there would be no anticipation then that in any deal with them that you would release the FTO designation on the Revolutionary Guard, is uh, that correct? Only if Iran takes necessary actions to merit uh, a lifting of the, de of the designation. And I would also note, Congressman, that were such a designation to be lifted under whatever circumstances, it can always be reimposed if Iran engages in actions that merit the imposition. Well, I, I don't know why, given the litany list of things that I just went through when we were in the JCPOA, when they were not supposed to be engaging in terrorist activity, where you just confirmed every single one of those incidents where they did engage in terrorist activity, that this administration would even be considering to remove the terrorist designation for the Revolutionary Guard. I certainly do not support that. Uh, those 900 Gold Star family members do not support that. And with all the force that I have as a member of Congress and as a, a service member who served in Iraq, Iraq and saw his service members, brothers and sisters, attacked by Revolutionary Guards, 15% uh, of which U.S. combat fatalities in the Iraq war were attributed to the Revolutionary Guards' activities, I, I think it would be abysmal for this administration to even consider lifting that foreign terrorist designation. And I would encourage you, and I know I'm a Republican and you're a Democrat and you're in a Democratic administration, but whatever... Uh, encouragement I could give you to stay strong on that and fight against terrorism. And if it is lifted, I will do everything within my power to fight against any lifting of the Iran Revolutionary Guard as a terrorist organization. And I hope that this administration will think very strongly about any attempt to do that in any deal that they would be negotiating with the Iranians. Uh, with that, I would yield the remainder of my time to Rep. Kim. And I'm happy to go a little bit over. I just want to say to you, Congressman, first of all, that I appreciate what you said, and we're both, of course, Americans, and we want the, the same things for our country. I'm pleased to be able to work with, with you and every member of this committee to achieve them. Sometimes we have differences of view on the best way to achieve them, but we have the same objectives. And certainly when it comes to Iran, we very much, I know, share the objective that it never acquire a nuclear weapon and that uh, it cease uh, the egregious actions that it's uh, undertaking, including targeting uh, Americans. Uh, including supporting proxies that do the same thing, including uh, going after our partners uh, and allies. The, the question is really uh, one for, for all of us to make uh, with our best judgment as to how can we be most effective doing that. And unfortunately, what we've seen uh, over the last few years is that the policy we inherited is not working. It's been a failure. Iran's nuclear program is moving forward. Its attacks, including notably against Americans, have increased, not decreased, despite the maximum pressure. So what I commit to very much is working with you, working with every other member, and I, I particularly appreciate your patriotism, your service, the, the Gold Star families. Uh, it's extraordinary, but uh, I commit to work with you to make sure that we can, whatever we're doing, is as effective as possible in dealing with the challenges that you rightfully point out. Thank you. So put one minute on the clock for Representative yes, Kerry, because <laughs> that was not Mr. Stubbe's time. Good to see you. Thank you very much. Uh, Congressman Stubbe, uh, I want to thank you for yielding. But point of clarification, Secretary, uh, are you willing to stay a little more than just a minute that was alluded uh, to me? Please, go ahead. Will that be OK, Chairman? Well, I'm going to give the Secretary a chance to ask her a I question that he I just have a couple of uh, areas that I wanted to Please, go ahead. On, so thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Secretary, first of all, on uh, Uyghur issues, your budget request says that scaling up international climate programs is a top priority for your department. So can you commit to us that any international climate program, uh, programs that you approve will completely eliminate ties to the CCP's genocide against Uyghurs, particularly to industries tied to Xinjiang province and the CCP's nationwide scheme of Uyghur forced labor, such as the solar panel and lithium uh, battery industries? 
We want to make sure of two things, Congressman. We want to make sure, first of all, that uh, our, our companies and others are not exporting to China tools that could be used for the repression of Uyghurs. Similarly, uh, we want to make sure that we are not importing uh, products that are made with uh, forced labor, including by the Uyghurs. Sometimes Thank this you. takes time to put into effect, but that, that is our determination. Sure. Dear ladies, time has expired. Uh, if, and I welcome receiving any further questions from you. We can take them up uh, on the record. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. Secretary, you've indicated uh, previously under the question of Mr. Stubbe that there was a question you wanted to answer in regards to Afghanistan. If you, uh, I think we've, uh, I think we've addressed that. Thank you very Great. much. So, in closing, uh, I'd like to again thank you, Mr. Secretary, uh, for being our esteemed witness today, uh, for your insightful testimony and participation today. In the past year, the State Department has made tangible progress in helping to diversify the department staff and internships, modernize our systems for passport processing, information technology, payroll, and other processes, and bolster workplace uh, flexibilities, training, and other resources for our diplomats. Uh, while this progress has been a great step in the right direction, we know, of course, we always have more work to do. But this budget request underscores the importance of diplomacy and development and the, of the robust, robust foreign assistance to foster key alliances and partnerships to confront the gravest challenges of our time. So building deeper relationships and helping other countries strengthen their democracies and defend themselves against outside aggression, much like the department and broader U.S. government is doing every day for Ukraine, is not just a matter of foreign policy. It makes Americans more secure, it serves America's interests by ensuring a more prosperous, stable world in which we all live. It shows that unity is important. I think that the camera of history will show that we are where we are now because of the unity that the State Department and the administration, 30 nations of NATO stayed together. Before, no one would have predicted that. It's the work of the administration and the State Department. Diplomacy at work, because we have to utilize that diplomacy to keep those 30 nations together. We could have gone off by ourselves, but we didn't. Diplomacy means working with others, not us by ourselves. Our allies in Asia, in Africa, others on Western Hemisphere, all staying together that is the work of diplomacy. That's why it is so important to have our ambassadors and diplomats in various places around the world. We were handcuffed for a while by not having ambassadors in certain key places. We've seen when they're there, diplomacy works. It works in one way or the other. It works in the way that if someone does decide to go off and be their own aggressive self, diplomacy will surround them and it works also to prevent when we don't have someone with evil intent from war from taking place. Yeah. So I want to thank you, and I'm grateful for the department's strong request for funding to continue to modernize the department and advance its foreign policy objectives. Again, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for always being receptive to me and Mr. McCall in a bipartisan way uh, in working. And I look forward to uh, continuing to work with you and seeing the results of your work to reform and lead the state in this vital work. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. And Chairman. And this hearing is now adjourned.